right, cool. Thanks for coming tonight. To learn about insects. My name is Mike Weissman. I am an entomologist. You all know what that is, right? Entomologist, the scientist who never grew up. <laughs> uh, and I never grew up. I've studied insects and their relatives, the arthropods. Tonight we're going to look at the arthropods. We're going to see how they're different from us. We're going to look what features they all have in common, how we tell them from other animals. We're going to look at the five main classes of arthropods, see how we come apart from each other, and then as time allows, we'll go into more detail about the insects, that's what I work with the most. Um, we'll look at uh, some of their adaptations, how they change as they grow, we'll look at some of the common species you might run into here at Chatfield. So that's the game plan. Could I get a way back there? Yeah, put a way <laughs> back here. Here's a picture of Mr. Boyce during the day. <laughs> a little bit about my background. Uh, I started my career as an entomologist at the University of Colorado Museum. When I was a kid, I was afraid of insects. Uh, my mom taught us to step on anything with lots of legs that move really fast. And so I stepped on a cat once thinking I was supposed to. That's just the way we were brought up. But when I got to college, I realized that insects were pretty cool. The more I learned about them, the cooler they were. And I had the good fortune of walking into the University of Colorado Museum one day uh, and looking at the drawers and drawers of insect specimens. Like, the, the gentleman there, who was a part-time curator, uh, must have uh, must have seen something in me he liked, I guess, or something. Earl Landon was the curator back then. They had a course called Internship in Entomology. So I took the course, and he said, well, I'm not teaching that course anymore. And I said, yeah, the catalog says you're teaching it. So mm -hmm. I'm taking the course. So basically, I became a slave. And he put me to work, working in the collection. And I stayed there about six years, because it was so cool working. Uh, I got my doctorate at Colorado State University studying crickets at Great Sandings National Monument. I'm uh, still an affiliate at CU Museum and also at uh, uh, Colorado State University working the collections there. I'm a research associate at Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Uh, I was co-founder of the Butterfly Pavilion, worked there as a curator for a couple of years, and then the politics got sour, and so uh, I ended up now I, I consult on the insect zoos and butterfly houses around the world, so I get to travel a lot for that. To Connecticut tomorrow to do some of that. Uh, in the summer, I've gone to the dark side. I work at the Colorado Mosquito Control. We do mosquito surveillance. So my job is to count them. My colleague kills them. And uh, between us, we get the job done. We have uh, traps all over the state that we monitor every week. And every summer, we go out and we do some mosquito populations, which is really tough as an environmentalist to do that. Um, and yet, the more I thought about it, the more I looked into it, the more I realized that those mosquitoes wouldn't have naturally been here 150 years ago, we created the situation that is producing them in these numbers. Uh, 150 years ago, someone could have brought West Nile here and it would not have taken over. Uh, they just weren't the kinds of mosquitoes around commonly to, to, to take them on. So I'm able to justify my summer job, and it's a lot of fun. I get to work with a lot of kids that way, uh, a lot of college kids to do that. So I want to start with the arthropods. First of all, all, all our pods have three features in common. If you look at the word, it makes more sense if you break it apart. I promised Emily if I use any Latin, I will define it, and this is an easy one. Arthro refers to joint, like a person with arthritis has pains in the joints. Pod means foot or leg, like a tripod has three legs. So what would arthropod mean? Jointed legs. Jointed legs, yeah, jointed legs. <laughs> all our pods have jointed legs, well, big deal. Any fifth grader will point out that we have jointed legs too, right? We have knee joints, ankle joints doesn't separate them from animals like us, but it would separate them from things like starfish, right? Sea starfish, they're not arthropods. Their legs aren't jointed. Or earthworms, they're not arthropods. They don't have any legs at all, right? So all arthropods have jointed legs. That's one thing they have in common. The second thing they have is the type of skeleton they have. Um, we have what's called an endoskeleton, an internal skeleton. You can feel that on your arm. The hard bones on the inside, the soft squishy muscles on the outside. But arthropods are different. I've got an arthropod here. Let's look at how he's different. Sorry. He's a hissing cockroach from Madagascar. I'm going to walk around with him. If you want, go ahead and gently pet him on the back. Notice how he feels. Oh, you're eating too. Wonderful. <laughs> Notice how he feels different from the way you feel. Compare the way he feels to the way your arm feels. Is he harder or softer than you? This is a test. We're seeing how many of you run screaming out of the room right now. If you can't handle putting a cockroach, the rest of the evening is going to be really rough on you. <laughs> I gotta tell you, my mom would be out the door right now. That's why I have to wait. I'm sorry, I had a regular cockroach one up and got my body one night. Oh, cool. 
outside on a cold night, your body still stays about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit because you control it. But cold-blooded animals are heterothermic, hetero meaning different thermic temperature. Heterothermic animals can't control their body temperature from the inside. So when they're in a cold place, they'll be cold. When they're in a warm place, they'll be warm. That's why he likes in my pocket. He's from the tropics where it's hot and humid. My pocket's kind of hot and sweaty, so he feels at home in there. So all our pots have those three features. Jointed legs, exoskeleton, and they're cold-blooded. Now, the cockroach is a type of arthropod known as an insect. Think back to second grade when you studied insects. What do <coughs> all insects have in common? Six legs. Six legs, good. What else? Head parts, abdomen. Three body sections, head parts and abdomen. Heads in front with the eyes and the mouth. So that's the sensory area. The thorax is in the middle with those six legs and sometimes wings. So that's the locomotor area. The abdomen's in the back. That's where the guts are, the reproductive organs. Um, that's, uh, all back there in the abdomen. What do you say about their eyes? The what? What do you say about their eyes? The eyes and the mouth are on the head. Oh, so okay. they're in that front oh, section, okay. part of the sensory part. So eyes, mouth, and then those other things sticking on the front. What are those? Antenna. Antennas. So they have two antennas. If you want to speak Latin, it's antennae, English antennas. Uh, but they're on the head also. So that's how you know this is an insect. Three body sections, that guards an abdomen, six legs, and two antennas. So I'm going to put Luigi back in my pocket. I'm going to bring out another animal with this next animal. Let's look at how she's different from the cockroach. This is a rose-haired tarantula from South America. <laughs> not everything we're going to look at today is just chapter. Okay, is she an arthropod? Yeah, we can bring her if she wasn't, right? Yeah, uh, she is an arthropod, right? She's got the jointed legs, the exoskeleton, and she's cold blooded. Is she an insect? No. Why not? How many legs? Eight legs instead of six. Good. How many body sections? Two. Only two. The head and thorax are fused together into what we call a cephalothorax. Cephalo just means head. So that's a fancy word for head thorax. And those eight legs come off the cephalothorax. That'd be like if we had our legs on our head. It'd be hard to walk after a while, but spiders do it all the time. How many antennas? Zero. That's right. She's an arachnid. Arachnids, like the spider, have two body sections. They have eight legs and no antennas. But she's still an arthropod. Those eight legs are jointed. She's cold blooded and she has an exoskeleton. What do you notice about her bones? It's different from the cockroach. Yeah, it was, yeah, they're covered with hair. It helps protect her. In the tropics where she lives, it rains a lot and the water will just drip off that hairy body. But also, the hair on her abdomen can cause itching. So if a dog tries to eat her, all she has to do is brush those itchy hairs into the dog's nose. The dog will run away crying, scratch up its nose, and leave it alone. That's how she protects herself. 
Her fang's about a quarter inch long, so she can bite. And it would hurt if she bit, but she wouldn't bite. Spiders like Gorosia and Tarantula are very gentle animals. They only bite if they're frightened. I bonk her on the head, she'll bite me. Bonk, bonk my little brother on the head, he'll probably bite me too, right? He was in the legislature. Yeah, but still, you know, they're not that different from people. Even if she did bite me, her bite's not venomous to people. It's, it's a very weak venom. It feels kind of unstable in my hand, which isn't pleasant, but I wouldn't die. I'm going to walk around with her. I'm going to give you a chance to see what she feels like. It's one of the softest animals you'll ever touch. I just ask that you only pet her on the legs. Uh, because uh, you don't want to put those irritating hairs, the itchy hairs on the abdomen. It probably won't make us itch because our skin is too thick, but she still doesn't like being touched there. But if you gently cut the legs, you'll notice how very, very soft those hairs are. That's because she can't see very well. So she'll sense the world around her through those, those thin little hairs, those very thin hairs. So if there's a predator coming up behind her, she can sense that. There's some food running in front of her, she can sense that, and it's all through those fine little hairs. And, and because they're so fine, they're so thin, she feels softer than velvet. This is one of the softest animals you'll ever touch. And a lot of people would be screaming running out of the room right now. Because naturalists still run into all sorts of scary things, like preschool groups and all. And so you don't want to be afraid of much. <laughs> on the legs, and you notice how very, very soft she is. Did you want to put the tarantula there while you're sitting down? Before I put her away? Very, very soft on the legs. Okay. Now, she's not venomous to people, but we do have a spider here at Chatfield that's venomous. Anybody know which one? Black Widow. Yeah, I'll stick with the Black Widow. Nope. <laughs> That's where the lawyers draw the line for something. I don't understand it, but for some reason the lawyers hate that. Some of them don't like the idea of me bringing one around. Black widows are very easy to recognize. They have a very fat, shiny black body. Most have a red spot on their abdomen, but not all of them. The red goes away when they get older. And their bite is venomous. If you got bit by a black widow, you probably wouldn't die from it. But you could get very sick for about two or three days. Your muscles cramp up and it hurts a lot. You feel like you're dying. You wish you were dying, but you never really kick off. So it's not fun to get bit by a black widow. Now, what do you do if you find a black widow? You're at my work. Yeah. Where do you work? I'm going to go there. Yeah, most places you ask what you do with a black widow if you find it, the immediate answer is squish it. Which, of course, is the wrong answer because if it for spiders like the black widow, there'd be so many flies in there you couldn't breathe. So it's important not to squish spiders when you find them. Best thing to do if they're not in your way is just leave them alone. She's uh, starting to fade. Yeah, she's old. It's just a very faint red mark on the belly side. How old do they live? They can live three years. And she's about two years old. Most of them only live about one year because they die in the cold, and, but if they find a good sheltered spot, uh, then they will die. And that's another thing. If you have questions, just ask them at any time. Don't worry about them. This isn't like a second grade group where we've got two hours, or one, 45 minutes rather to get through everything. We've got as much time as we need tonight. So feel free to ask questions. Um, so yeah, best thing to do if you find one, they're not in the way, leave them alone. If they are in the way, like inside the building or something, Pick the largest person in the group, have them catch a jar to get outside so Because the venom is, is body size dependent. The larger your body is, uh, the less effect the venom is going to have on you. So I'm toast. A football player might just get a headache or something. <laughs> uh, they have eight eyes, but they're almost completely blind. They can't see you. So of course, you don't have to run away from them. They can't see you to chase after you. The way they know what's going on around them is they feel vibrations in the web. If a fly hits the web, they'll shake the web. That way, they know there's food in it. If something hits the web hard, they'll know it's danger. They'll try to run away. It's very rare for people to die from black widow bites. More people are struck by lightning every year than have died from black widow bites in the last 100 years. More people are killed by champagne corks every year than black widow bites. So it's very rare to die from it. Even back in the old days when we had outdoor plumbing, the outhouses and stuff, people would get bit more often then because they love outhouses. They'd build their web across the toilet seat where the flies go up and down. People would sit down and tend to get bit where they didn't want to. In the outhouse, yeah. Um, but even back then, it's rare to get bit by a black widow. Uh, uh, and definitely rare to die from it. But they are the only venomous spider in Colorado. There's two species of Western and Eastern. Now, a lot of people say, well, what about the proper clues? We don't have those in Colorado. But you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, yeah, we've got them. My Aunt Sophie got the brown clues bite and her skin rotted away, and now she's got a big hole in her arm or something. And a lot of times, well, the different, their bite is different. The brown clues bite will cause 
necrosis, it will cause the skin to rot. <coughs> but so will ant bites, uh, conos, bugs, kindergartners, they all have a bite that can rot your skin. So the boy on a brown recluse isn't fair. Well, it turns out we don't have them in Colorado. But a lot of the doctors don't know that. They're not expected to be arachnologists, so it's not their fault. Their medical book says the product bite brown recluse. The chances are it's something like MRSA or, or skin infection, or it could even be a paper cut that got infected, or some other thing. If it's a brown recluse here in Colorado, I want to see the spider. You can't tell by the bite. <laughs> we have had records of them. There was uh, one in Pueblo uh, many years ago. There was a farm in Rocky Ford that had them. They came in with suitcases from Tennessee or farm equipment from Kansas. That's, uh, they're more of southeastern U.S. They like more humidity. They're more north into Illinois and, and uh, Ohio a bit, but it's mostly southeast. Tennessee is a good spot for them. It's just too dry here. So you'll hear people say we've got brown recluses, but don't believe it. It's just one of those myths out there. All right. Where's the venom come out of on a spider? Was that? The fangs. Yeah, they bite their food to kill it. Not all arachnids are like that. We've got another arachnid here. How do I know? How many body sections? Two. Two. How many legs? Eight. Eight. How many antennas? Nine. Zero. But this one's a little different. This one's asleep. <laughs> this one's a scorpion. The way a scorpion catches its food, it'll reach out and grab it with the claws in front. Then if it can't hang on, it'll reach around and sting it with the venom in its tail. Now, a lot of scorpions wouldn't hold like this. Most scorpions, not most scorpions, but a lot of scorpions have a dangerous venom. This one's called an emperor scorpion. They come from the rainforest of Africa. Look how big and strong her claws are. She could just grab her food. She doesn't have to sting it. So I'm not worried about holding an emperor scorpion. The ones to watch out for have little wimpy claws. They can't hang out of their food as well, so they need a stronger venom to catch their food. The emperor scorpions, they sell in pet stores. Some people have them as pets. They're not good pets. They don't come when you call them. They don't do any tricks. Do they still strike with their tails? Yeah. That's why I'm holding it by the tail. But mostly, with this one, I'm more worried about it pinching, because it hurts like crazy when they pinch. Why my pen is distracting him. But um, again, I've been hit twice with the venom, and your, your finger gets a bit sore, it feels like it's burning or something, but and it swells up a little bit, but it's not really dangerous. Uh, nice thing is they don't wet on the rug. That's one way they're a better pet than some of the dogs. Now, there used to be scorpions here in the Chatfield Basin back in the 1800s. They don't like people, and so that, oh, thank you. <laughs> They don't like people very much, and so as as development happened, the scorpions were eradicated around here. We, the species that used to occur in this area does no longer occur. But we do have about a half dozen species still occurring in other parts of Colorado. Now, the coolest thing to me about scorpions is the way we find them. Um, can I hit those lights over there? All right. We use a special light called the ultraviolet light. We wander around the desert or the rainforest with UV light. Let's do this one. No, I'm gonna have to do them both. Everything's dark except the scorpions. They glow green or orange or blue. Uh, and so we pick them up with our glow-in-the-dark tweezers, we pop them in our glow-in-the-dark bag, and that's how we catch them. So I have three in here now. So that black scorpion is now suddenly blue. And I got eight in here. Okay. Or greenish. Now one thing to remember, if you ever go scorpion hunting in the desert, Rattlesnakes do not glow in the dark with ultraviolet light. <laughs> Always check the white light first, and then go back through with the ultraviolet light. <laughs> so those are emperor scorpions in the dark. Our native scorpions glow just as well. If you're ever out at uh, Colorado National Monument, it's a great place to find them. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, you don't want to trip over seventy-two. Trip with a scorpion in your hand? That's not good. All right, where's that light switch? I love scorpions, it's real romantic. Um, so I have a question. Yes? Is it just scorpions? Uh, as far as we know, whenever you say just, there's always something else. There are some caterpillars that fluoresce like that. The sand dunes crickets kind of fluoresce. That's how I was able to, to study them without disturbing them at the sand dunes. The scorpions are the ones that really glow well. And I, I believe it was discovered by geologists, because geologists are always looking for fluorescent minerals. And one of the rocks started moving, and they're like, whoa, something's weird here. So that's what I knew it was a, uh, that's when they, they found out scorpions fluoresce. Now, we know that how, we know how they fluoresce. It's the way the light reflects off the exoskeleton. But we don't know why they fluoresce, whether it gives them any advantage or not. I suspect that they can detect some energy coming off of that glowing. You know, what we see as glowing, they detect as energy. 
and that way they know if their tail is sticking out in the sunlight or something like that. They can move underneath a rock, get out of the sun, and they're so they have to get into the darkness. So it's probably a way for them to tell where the sunlight's coming from or where the UV light is or something like that. But we don't have proof of that. There's no way to know. Um, spiders are arachnids that have venom in their mouth. Scorpions are arachnids that have venom in their tail. But some arachnids have no venom at all. I've got one more arachnid here that I like to show off. This one's a vinegaroon. Vinegaroon is related to a scorpion. But it doesn't have, it does not have a stinger on its tail. It has a long skinny tail that squirts vinegar out of it. Vinegar is acetic acid. So if you get acid in your eyes, it will hurt a lot. And that's the way the vinegar protects itself. If the dog tries to grab it, all it has to do is squirt a little vinegar in the dog's eyes. The dog can't see for a minute, and that way the vinegar can get away. And they don't need a stinger on their tail because their claws are sharp and strong. They can just grab their food. They don't have to sting it. Vinegaroons live in the deserts of southern Arizona, northern Mexico, um, and places like that. They might live in southern Colorado, but we haven't found them here yet. It would not surprise me to find them here in Chatfield if uh, the conditions were a little bit different. We have a longer growing season. What's but it right called? now, they don't occur here. It's a vinegaroon or a tail, uh, a tailed whip scorpion, or a long tailed whip scorpion. And they're arachnids two body sections, eight legs, and no antennas. Those things on the front that look like antennas are actually his front legs. He can't see very well, so he'll feel around with his front legs like a blind person using a cane. That's how they find their way around. So, spiders, scorpions, vinegarins are all arachnids. Two body sections, eight legs, and no antennas. Next group, crustaceans. Who can name an example of crustacean? Crab. Crab, yum. Delicious. Any other yummy ones? Crawdad. Crawdad, yeah, they're pretty Lobster. good. Lobster's good. Shrimp. Pillbugs and roly polies are also crustaceans. I brought a hermit crab. It's hard to get native crustaceans this time of year. I don't know if Sebastian's going to go for a walk for us or not. But, uh, crustaceans like the crab, shrimp, and lobster have 10 legs. Pillbugs and roly polies have 14 legs. And if he comes out, you'll be able to see that crustaceans have four antennas instead of two or none. There he goes. And so you can see those four antennas sticking out of there. Most crustaceans live in water. They breathe oxygen through gills. Even these ones that live on land, like the hermit crab, have to go back to water regularly to keep their body moist. You find pill bugs and raw employees in moist places underneath rocks and logs because they have to stay moist to survive. How many of you ever eaten a crustacean? Crab, shrimp, lobster, jambalaya? It's yummy stuff, huh? How many of you ever eaten an insect? You should all have your hands up. You all have. You ever had spaghetti sauce? Peanut butter? Cookies, biscuits, you eat insects. A bunch of them in there. We don't just don't realize it because they're all chopped up in our food. A lot of us think that's gross just because of the way we're brought up. Uh, but if you were hanging out with the kids in the rainforests of Colombia, every now and then you'd see uh, them pop, take a big palm meal out of a palm tree and pop a big juicy grub in their mouth with the juice dripping down their chin. And we think it's kind of gross just because of the way we're brought up, but they think some of the stuff we eat is gross too. They think it's disgusting to eat chickens. Because then chickens are real dirty birds. They keep them around for the eggs, but they wouldn't want to eat one. Tell those kids about chicken soup, they'll get sick of cereal, boil a dirty bird, then you drink the juice. It's kind of gross when you think about it, right? It depends on how you're brought up as to what you think is good to eat or not. In our culture, we eat a lot of crustaceans. In other parts of the world, they eat a lot of insects. And we just don't realize it because they're chopped up in our food. So that's a crustacean. Two more groups, centipedes and millipedes. Let's start with the centipedes. They're both closely related to each other. They're also closely related to the insects. They have two antennae just like the insects. They have a lot more legs, a lot more body sections. Let's start with the centipedes. The largest kind of centipede in Colorado is called a tiger centipede. And we probably have them down here in Waterton Canyon, although I've not gone looking for them there. The word centipede means 100 legs, but they don't really have 100 legs. Whoever named it was exaggerating. This one has about 40. Centipedes have two legs on each body section. And centipedes are carnivores. What's that mean to be a carnivore? It means they eat meat. Eat meat, right. Spider meat, cricket meat. So I'm not worried about holding a centipede. Mm -hmm. uh, or no, I am worried about holding I wouldn't hold a centipede. Because they have venom in their bites helping catch their food. So that's why I'm not holding the centipede. Being carnivores, they help have venom so you can catch your food easier. One of the cool things about this centipede is the head looks a lot like the tail. That's a form of deception. A predator attacking the centipede is not going to know which end to attack. 
and so it might be able to escape if the tanks are wrong in. But these guys have a little venom in their tail, and they have a little venom in their bike. So if you pick them up, you'll realize that they can fly. Because they will bite and sting you, and they'll fly across the room. And you'll realize you could fly, because you can fly the other direction. It hurts, it burns. So that's why I don't pick up the centipede. Let's compare that to the millipedes. Now, the millipedes here in Colorado are little dinky things. If, if you go in your basement after a rain, or a window well, or pick up a rock or a log, you see these little tiny worm-like things that are black with tiny little legs on them. They're all coiled up. That's a Colorado millipede. Kind of hard to see. So instead, I brought some African millipedes. They're a little easier to work with. Now, these are just baby African millipedes. They're going about three times larger when they're full grown. No, no. I was bit by a preschooler once, so I had to get shots after that. That's how I'm terrified of preschoolers. But what I found is when you're afraid of something, like I used to be afraid of insects too, the more you learn about them, the less scary they are. So now that I've got grandkids, the preschoolers aren't quite as scary as they used to be. But if you want, you can go ahead and cut one of these. The word millipede means thousand legs, but they don't really have a thousand legs. Again, it's an exaggeration. These have about 200 legs, which is still a lot if you have to tie their Nikes every day, but it's not a thousand. And millipedes differ from centipedes because millipedes have four legs on most body sections instead of two. What was that? Millipedes have four legs on most body sections instead of two. So centipedes have two legs on each body section. Millipedes have four legs on most body sections. That's the main way to tell them apart. And millipedes are herbivores. It means they eat plants. So I'm not worried about holding millipedes. Most vegetarians don't bite. Oh, I used to be married to one, but most of them don't bite. <laughs> That doesn't mean that they're not protected, they're very well protected. Millipedes have toxins in their blood. So if you ate a millipede, you'd get lots of little legs stuck between your teeth, but you also get sick from the poisons in their blood. So uh, that's the main way to protect themselves. And if I disturb these guys too much, you'll see my hands start to stain because they'll exude some of those toxins from the pores on the side of their body. So you don't have to actually eat one to get sick, you just lick one or taste one to get sick, and uh, those toxins will, yeah, they're very bad tasting. Even the Colorado ones? The Colorado ones, I believe, have some yes, but it's a small dose, so you have to eat a bunch of them to get sick. I don't recommend it. Yeah. The blue ones, like the curl, like yeah, I'll coil up. They're not. They're not any poison, right? What's that? Do they have any poison? You have to eat them to get the toxins. So if you don't consume them, they can't deliver it to you. Like these guys can't bite me and give me the toxin, but if uh, if I disturb them, they'll start consuming. One thing that's cool about millipedes is the way they walk, but I don't think they're gonna do that for us, or you can try maybe. Put them on the table, see if they go for a walk, but I think it's a little bit too cold. They don't like the cold very much. Those of you who touched them, you felt that exoskeleton. Those 200 legs are joining, uh, and they're cold-blooded, so they are arthropods. They're not gonna go for a walk. Yeah, it's just too cold. It, well, maybe it will. Think about the, can you imagine having 200 legs and not tripping over yourself? <laughs> and you can try this with a group of kids sometime. Have them get in line and hang on to the waist of the person in front of them and try walking without tripping over each other. Eventually, they'll realize that the only efficient way to do it is one leg doesn't step down until the leg in front of it picks up. So it forms a wave-like motion. When you look at them walk, it'll look like a wave. When these guys are full grown, they'll be about three times as big, and then it's very distinct if you really see that wave. If it goes for a walk, we might be able to see a little bit of the wave-like action. But I think that table's a little too cold for it. Yeah. And I'm not going to put it on the stove that's a little too high for it. So. <laughs> but if you ever get a chance, check out millipede walking. It's, it's really amazing the way they do that wave-like motion, and that way they don't trip on each other. And, and kids pick it up after a little while. It's a neat little activity. Eventually, kids in the line can walk like a millipede. It's because they want to go find somewhere warmer. These are tropical millipedes. This Colorado thing is really crazy for them. Even though they're bred in captivity, they don't know the difference. You kind of can see that wave-like yeah, motion. Antenna. Yeah, they have two antennas, just like the insects. So uh, they're very closely related to the insects, as are the centipedes. But they put them in their own group because they're different enough. And those are the five main classes of arthropods. Insects, arachnids, crustaceans, centipedes, and millipedes. There's some minor classes that you'll never ever see unless you go deep sea diving or something. Uh, there's some fossil groups that you rarely see. But here on the trails of Chatfield, you'll run into all five of those. The insects especially. You'll see arachnids like the spiders. Probably not scorpions, but you'll see spiders. Are all the legs the same? 
There are some different ones. So the eighth segment down is what's called a gonopod. Gono meaning reproductive organ, pod meaning foot-like. So they have their reproductive organs are kind of foot-like and they're in the eighth segment down. That's how you have to tell the males from the females. There's that wave motion. Can you see it on that one? Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Johnny Carson always said kids and animals are the hardest to do what you want them to do. Um, they, see they can tell light and dark, and they prefer dark. So <laughs> it's going away from the brightest light nearby, I guess, is trying to go the other direction. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it'll be about three times as big when it's full. So, crustaceans, you'll see crawdads in the water. You'll see millipedes if you pick up rocks and logs, and maybe even centipedes down here. I'm sure the small centipedes are here, at least. So you'll see representatives of all five classes. The smallest arthropods are microscopic. There's some arachnids, some mites that are tiny. That, there's microscopic, you need a microscope to find them. There's some that live in your eyelashes. You don't even realize that they're there. And rubbing your eyes doesn't get rid of them. They're the smallest <laughs> arthropods in the world that we know of. They might be small. The largest arthropods are a type of crustacean. You go in the deep waters off the coast of Japan, there's a crab called the giant Japanese spider crab. It gets to be about nine feet. From the tip of the claws to the tip of the back legs, a little bigger than I can get. Do people eat them? Yes, but they're real chewy. You can feed a whole village. Yeah. Uh, what a crab feast. But it, yeah, real chewy. It's kind of like a king crab meat. It's kind of chewy after a while. These guys are even more so. Uh, but they're scavengers. You can hug them, they won't bite. As long as they don't smell like dead fish, you're probably safe. If you ever get to Osaka, Japan, there's an aquarium there called the Ring of Fire Aquarium. They have a tank about the size of this room with a dozen of those crabs in it. There's nothing more impressive than looking through the glass at an arthropod that's as big as you are, mm -hmm. staring back at you, it's pretty impressive. So they're the largest arthropods that we know of. The rest of the time, I just want to focus on the insects. That's the group I work with the most. The neat thing about my job is I get to travel around the world. My favorite place to go is the tropical rainforest. If you went to the rainforest of Africa or Central America or Asia, you might see some insects that look like these. A lot of people ask me, are they real? Yeah, they're just real dead, but they are real. Some of the insects in the tropics can get really big because they don't have to worry about winter. They can keep growing all year round. There's tiny insects in the rainforest too, but some get really big. So let's start with the two on the side here. What kind of insects are those? Beetles. Beetles, yeah. You can tell beetles because beetles have four wings. The two on the outside are hard like shells. They fly with the soft wings underneath. You've held a ladybug before, right? Yeah. Ladybugs are kind of beetle. When they fly, they move the hard wings on the side and they fly with the soft wings underneath. These can fly too. Can you imagine driving down the highway in Africa at 50 miles an hour and having these hit you into <laughs> Yeah, I'd probably go right through out the back. You kids in Africa can string around the thorax of these beetles, flying around just like my airplanes. Really okay, these other insects. Giant Asian katydid, the stick insect, the leaf insect. Why would an insect want to look like a stick or a leaf? What's the advantage of that? What's that mean, camouflage? That they blend in with their scenery so they're less obvious to the predators that want to. They blend in with their background. Uh, they can hide from predators. Are, are they camouflaged against the white background? No. no. You have to be on the right colored background for the camouflage to work. If they were on a green or brown background when they were alive, they were green. If they were on a green or brown background, they'd be much better camouflaged. Are they camouflaged if they're out there dancing around? No. Now we have to look like the background, we also have to act like the background. Since leaves don't dance around, the leaf insect can't dance around either. They'll sit very still all day long, just like a leaf. If it has to move, it tries to wait till night time, but it can't be seen. If it moves in the daytime, you'll see they rock back and forth, kind of like a, a leaf being blown in the wind. That way they won't blow their camouflage. So, their camouflage to hide from predators that want to eat them, but we also have an insect here in Colorado, right here at Chetfield, that's camouflaged to hide from its food, from its prey. Keeper is prey. What's an insect camouflaged to hide from its prey? Yeah, prey mantis. Here we have the European praying mantis predominantly. There's some native species too, but the European praying mantis does really, really well down here. Um, I have nothing against European imports, my father's one, but they have taken over and out competed our native mantis. But the European mantis, uh, and all the praying mantis, they'll sit on a branch and just like a twig. And a flyer or a cricket will come right up next to it, not even see it there until it's too late. Mantis will reach out, grab the fly, and turn it into mantis chow. So some insects like the mantis are camouflaged to hide from prey. Others like the stick insect and leaf insect and camouflage hide from predators. So that's two different reasons for being camouflaged. Are any of them dangerous at all? Or are they dangerous? Well, the really big ones, the Chinese mantis, when they grab you, it hurts. They pinch really hard. Yeah, it hurts a lot. I don't have a live one this time of year, but I do have 
some eggs. And if you're wandering around Chatfield this time of year, you might see what looks like a little foam case. And inside this foam case is maybe 50 praying mantis eggs. And mom lays the eggs in the fall, and then she freezes to death. And in the spring, these eggs will hatch out, and the little baby mantis will go running around trying to avoid being eaten by each other, and then they'll eat aphids and things like that. Now, mom's not around to take care of the kids, and it's a myth that mom eats the babies. All those cartoons with the mom mantis eating the babies. No, she's not alive anymore. The way she provides for the kids is she'll lay the eggs on a place where there's likely to be food. So you find them on rose bushes, things like that, where there's going to be aphids the next year. Uh, we found some on the bottom of a rock when we were out here last summer. It's kind of strange, but there's just maybe not enough places to lay their eggs. I've got a Chinese praying mantis egg case here, too. It's a lot larger. It's one of the largest species in the world. And they become established back east, places like Washington, D.C. I was out in D.C. a couple of weeks back, and we went walking around Rock Creek, and we found some Chinese mantis egg cases. So the European mantis, Chinese mantis, were introduced into the U.S. specifically for pest control. They eat a lot of aphids. And so people brought them in to eat their aphids so in the garden. Will those sprout babies? Yep, we'll have babies in the spring. I have them in the refrigerator this time of year, but I'll bring them out later in the okay. season and we'll have babies all And that the temperature is what you go to them to come out? Yeah, temperature is a major factor. Yeah. How many did you say right now? The little ones, 50. Mm -hmm. The big the Chinese mantis, 75 to 100. Yeah? Is the European mantis like a yellowish green? They, they can be green or they can be brown. They come in both colors. Yeah, that long. The Carolina mantis is almost that long. The main way to tell them apart is if you look at the forearm, the praying mantis has a, a black and white target-like spot right there, which is actually a hearing organ. It's not really an ear like our ears, but they can detect vibrations through it. And so look at the front legs when they're, when they're getting ready to snap. If you see that black and white target there, that's a European praying mantis. All right, some other insects. Everyone's favorite, the butterflies. These are all butterflies right here in Chatfield area. Even people who don't like insects or claim not to like insects will make an exception for the butterflies. Um, if you grow grass in your yard, you're not going to see any of these butterflies. They don't eat grass. They drink nectar from flowers. In our yard, we tore all the grass and put in a huge butterfly garden. Every summer we have lots of butterflies and I never have to mow the lawn again. So we encourage people to get rid of that blue grass and grow it to mow it. Plant it really serves no purpose. You saw the garden out here last summer, lots of butterflies. The most common one, unfortunately, is the European cabbage white, which is still a beautiful butterfly, but it's not native to here. That's probably one of the more, one of the more common ones you see around here. Uh, it's common because we feed it well. Its caterpillars eat things like broccoli and cabbage and things like that. So because we feed them, they grow. Um, if you're planning for butterflies, you not only want to plan for the adults, you want to plan for the larvae. You can't have college kids without preschoolers, so you want to have uh, plants for the caterpillars to eat as well. We'll talk about that a little later with the PowerPoint. So these are some Colorado butterflies. Who can name the, uh, the state insect? Who knows what the state insect is? Yeah? Uh, Colorado hair street. Colorado hair street butterfly. You'll be amazed at how many people say state insect. We have a state insect. They know the state dinosaur is a stegosaurus, but they, they know the lark bunting is a state bird. Half the people have never seen a lark bunting up here. Uh, but they don't know the Colorado hair streak. Colorado hair streak was chosen by a group of fourth graders way back in 1996. Hair streak? Colorado hair streak. Now, most of the kid groups you deal with weren't born in 1996. So to them, this was a long time ago. And I remember it well. They chose the Colorado Hair Street butterfly because it occurs all over Colorado on the East Slope and the West Slope, and very few other places. A little bit in New Mexico, a little bit in Utah, but it's mainly a Colorado butterfly. So is it purple? It's kind of purplish, yeah. On the inside. On the other side, it's brown and gray. So <coughs> the Colorado Hair Street has the same colors as some of our other symbols, purple like the columbine flower, a little bit of bronco orange in there. <laughs> now, as a plane, you can say avalanche purple, right? Um, they also have some cool adaptations that we'll talk about in a minute. But the Colorado Hair Street butterfly is our state insect. We'll leave that there for now. So this is some Colorado butterflies. To show you some of the adaptations that butterflies have, I'm going to use tropical butterflies for that because they have they 
demonstrate it a little bit better. People say, well, why can't we have butterflies like this in Colorado? Well, we do. They're up at the butterfly pavilion. It's totally artificial. Occasionally, these might fly into Colorado. If you get a big hurricane down in Central America, Colorado, the, the zebra longwing, there's a giant uh, citrus swallowtail that's been found in Colorado right across the way at the Chapel Arboretum. So, or whatever they call it now, the Botanic Gardens plants over there. So these are some tropical butterflies from Central America. Let's start with one at the bottom center here. This one's called a glass wing butterfly. Its wings are clear. Why would you want to have clear wings as a butterfly? What advantage would that be? Perfect camouflage, isn't it? No matter what background they're sitting on, they blend right in. They're so well camouflaged, they have trouble finding each other. That's why they have the red spots on the high wings so they can find each other. Okay, let's compare that to the one next to it. This black and red and yellow butterfly is called a postman. Now, if the postman was sitting on a green leaf, would it be camouflaged? No. Wouldn't have to be, though, because the postman butterfly tastes gross. The reason it tastes so bad is when it was a caterpillar, it ate a toxic plant called a passion vine. But instead of getting sick from the toxins, it put those toxins inside its own body. When it became an adult butterfly, it still has those poisons in its body. So if a bird eats a postman butterfly, it's going to get sick and throw up. It's going to remember for a long time that these black and red and yellow things are gross tasting. That's called warning colors. Warning colors are kind of the opposite of camouflage. They warn their enemies to leave them alone. So do I eat some? Yeah, very few things. Yeah. Yeah, bacteria. There's some bacteria trapped in them. There are some predators that are immune to the toxins, or, don't, or they, they just let the toxins flow through them and don't get sick from them. But most predators chew one of these and spit them out right away. And they remember that the black and red and yellow is gross. So warning colors is the opposite of camouflage. They warn their enemies to leave them alone. In the case of the postman, it's saying that its predators don't eat meat, I taste bad. And it works kind of like my mom's tuna casserole. It always comes out in the same red pan, right? You only have to taste it once to know. When you see that red pan, something gross is for dinner, right? <laughs> it triggers the memory. That's the way warning colors work. They warn their enemies to leave them alone. The black widow spider, black and red, not camouflage. It doesn't have to be. She's warning about the venom. Yellow jacket wasp, black and yellow. They have a stinger. They don't have to. A skunk, black and white, they stink. So animals that smell bad, have a stinger, have toxins, have venom, they don't have to be camouflaged. They use bright warning colors to warn their enemies to leave them alone. Let me take this blue morpho butterfly out. It comes to the rainforest of South and Central America. The rainforest is really dark because there's so many trees that blocks out the sun. So if you're a butterfly in the dark forest and want to find your mates, it helps to have these bright colors so you can find each other in the dark. But check out the backside. This is what you see when their wings are closed. Dull and brown. Pretty well camouflaged. So if they want to hide, they close their wings. If they want to be seen, they open them. That also protects them. If a bird tries to grab onto it, all it has to do is open its wings. The bright flash of blue in the bird's face will startle it. Like if you picked up a cookie and it turned bright blue, you, you wouldn't want to eat it, right? So that's the way they protect themselves. Also, if the blue morpho is flying away from a bird or an entomologist, all it has to do is land and close its wings. And the birds are going to be looking around for something blue won't see the brown butterfly sitting there. So that's another, another way the bright colors help protect them in the forest. Our own Colorado Hair Street butterfly has that same startle adaptation. When the wings are closed, it's dull gray and brown, really well camouflaged. If they want to find a mate or startle an enemy, all you have to do is open their wings. That bright flash of purple and orange is going to scare away predators. So our own Colorado Hair Street butterfly uses that same startle adaptation. We talked about the next adaptation a little bit with the centipede, but I'm going to bring it up again here with this owl butterfly. It's not called an owl because how big it is. It's called an owl butterfly because this is what you see when its wings are closed. Now, why would a butterfly want to have big eyes on its wings? What's the advantage of that? Yeah, it might look like a big animal. A bird with little tiny eyes sees that great big eye. It's going to think there's a great big animal behind that great big eye. But a lot of birds are going to attack anyway. If a bird attacks this butterfly, where do you think it's going to aim? Right at that fake eye, yeah. So the, the butterfly is going to lose a piece of wing, but it might still get away. Whereas if it loses its head, it's dead. So by having that target out on the wing, it draws the attention away from the body, out to the wing, and that way the predator misses the butterfly and the butterfly gets away. That's called deception. Deception, just like with the centipede, not knowing head from tail, it's when an animal fools its enemies into thinking something different about it. In the case of the owl butterfly, its enemies think it has those great big eyes on it. I own call it a hair streak butterfly uses deception as well. It's called a hair streak because of those two little hairs on the hind wings. When they sit with their wings closed, they'll move those hairs up and down. So they look kind of like antennas. And that orange spot looks kind of like an eye spot. So a predator attacking a collar or a hair streak butterfly doesn't know which end is the tail and the head, which end is the head, which end is the tail. And if they attack the tail, the butterfly is going to get away. It's going to lose those, the, the tail and the hairs. 
than the back of the wing, but it'd still be able to fly and get away. So by having that deception, they fool predators into leaving them alone. What's the average lifespan of the caterpillar and the butterfly? Depends on the species. Okay. Yeah. So the tropical ones, the adults live a couple weeks, caterpillars maybe six weeks, the pupa stage about 10 days. But some butterflies overwinter as adults, like a monarch butterfly, the morning club around here overwinters as an adult. So they live several months as an adult. We'll talk about that a little more with the slides too. So our Colorado Hair Street butterfly uses a startle adaptation and also uses that deception. The best example of deception, in my opinion, though, has got to be the tiger swallowtail butterflies. These big yellow and black ones in the corners here. When their caterpillars first hatch out of the egg, the caterpillars look just like bird poop. Isn't that a great idea to look like bird poop? You think a bird's going to eat something that looks like bird poop? No. So by having that deception, they fool the birds into leaving them alone. So camouflage, warning colors, startle colors, deception, those are all adaptations that you're going to find. Insects are some of the best animals for uh, for examples, when you're looking for examples of camouflage, you're looking for examples of warning colors, startle colors, insects are some of the best animals to find out there in the field to demonstrate those things. So, and those are the four main ones that most schools study about in their curriculum. Sometimes you'll hear camouflage called crypsis or cryptic coloration. Sometimes you'll hear warning colors called aposematism. Those big exciting words. Warning color sounds easier to say. All right, one more topic I want to go through before we take a break. I'm going to erase the board here and put a big word in its place. A word that you studied about way back in second grade, which for me was 40 years ago or more, I don't remember. It was weird, I did a bug program at my old elementary school a couple weeks ago. It was weird walking through those halls again, <laughs> thinking about what my sixth grade science teacher would think of me now. Yeah, goof off, kid. <laughs> All right, big word. Math, ah, uh, more, pho, sis. Please apologize to Emily for me again. I promised I wouldn't use big Latin words, but I really don't know how to get around it with some of these. <laughs> but it's easy to understand. All these big scientific words are easy to understand when you break them apart. Meta means beyond. Or in this case, it means uh, a change. Morph means shape or form. And cis means your sister. No, uh, cis means a process. So it's a process of changing your form. As insects grow, they change their form. Let's take an example. What's a butterfly start out as? Larvae. Before that? Egg. Egg. So we'll start with an egg. I can draw an egg. A glitter and an on tie. Well, probably not. <laughs> See, I'm used to, this time of year, I usually do my no sex like insects talk. And I'm really trying hard to avoid that topic, but it'll come up sometimes, it always does. <laughs> egg, I'm sorry, the egg, the egg has, what did you say, the larva? Which doesn't look very much like a butterfly. This one doesn't even look very much like a caterpillar. <laughs> That's why you should pay attention in art class, right? But I didn't. Yeah, so scientists call this stage the larva. The larvae of different insects, we call different things depending on what they're going to grow up to be. The larva of a, a butterfly or a moth, we call a caterpillar. The larva of a beetle, we call a grub or a mealworm. How about a fly larva? Can you see us eye fans in here? Maggot. Yeah, maggot grows up to be a fly. So different larvae, we'll call different things depending on what they grow up to be. Okay, what's the larva turn into next? For the, full, for the butterfly? The Before the butterfly. Okay. Chrysalis or cocoon. Scientists call that stage the pupa. The pupa of a silk moth, we'll call it a cocoon. The pupa of a butterfly, we call it chrysalis. What comes out of the pupa? The butterfly. Looks kind of like this and like that. Good enough. Scientists call that stage the adult or the imago. It's the only stage that can lay more eggs and start to cycle over again. It's also the only stage that has wings. Once they grow their wings, that's as big as they're ever going to get. So if you find a little tiny butterfly, it's not a baby butterfly, it's a full-grown adult. The baby was a caterpillar. Same is true if you find a little beetle. It's not a baby beetle, it's a full-grown adult too. The baby was a grub or a mealworm. Got some beetles here. Now, I probably have the eggs, but I couldn't find them for you right now because they're microscopic. But I do have a larva, which looks like a worm. The pupa, which looks like just a yellow blob. 
and the adult is a beetle. All right, so the egg is microscopic. The larva looks like a worm. The pupa looks like a yellow blob, and the adult is a beetle. Now, the pupa is not sleeping, it's changing. It's not only changing its shape from a worm-like larva into the winged adult beetle, it's also changing its behavior. Because all the larva cares about doing is eating and growing, all the adult wants to do is find a mate and find a good place to lay their eggs. So they not only change their shape inside the pupa, they also change their behavior. If you think being a teenager was rough, imagine being a pupa with the changes they have to go through. <laughs> Egg is microscopic, larva looks like a worm, the pupa looks like a yellow blob, and the adult is a beetle. That's hard to believe, but all three of these are the same kind of insect. In a couple weeks, that larva will be a pupa. In a few days, that pupa will be an adult beetle. The beetle has already started laying eggs, and soon those eggs will hatch into more larvae and start the cycle over again. So four stages of metamorphosis, four stages of change as they grow. We call that complete metamorphosis. Complete metamorphosis is the four stages from egg to larva to pupa to adult. Now, do all insects have to go through all those stages? No. No. You ever see a baby grasshopper or baby cricket? Looks just like a grasshopper or a cricket. Let me get back to the board there a second. So did you say you were not going to talk about how butterflies have sex? Can you give like a two-sentence overview? Yeah, we'll get to maybe the okay. slides. <laughs> I don't want to dwell too long on that sex life of insects, because we, we, that's a whole night all to itself. <laughs> Do that some other night, though. OK, the, so the. Crickets and grasshoppers still start out as an egg, but the egg hatches into what we call a nymph. And the nymph just has to grow larger to become an adult. The adult lays more eggs and starts to cycle over again. Now, in most cases, the nymph looks just like the adult, except it's smaller and it doesn't have wings yet. Preschoolers are kind of like nymphs too, right? They look just like adults, except they're smaller and they don't have cars yet. But they don't start out looking like worms. They don't have to go inside a cocoon. All they have to do is get bigger. A lot of insects are like that too. I've got a nymph here. Let's see if you could tell me what Junior's going to grow up to be. Come here, Junior. What do you think Junior's going to grow up to be? Whoa, well, you can't fly. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You saw his dad earlier. Let me pull his dad back up. Junior is a hissing cockroach now. He looks just like his dad, except he's smaller. He doesn't start out looking like a worm. He doesn't have to go inside a cocoon. All I have to do is get bigger. So we call that incomplete metamorphosis. Three stages from egg to nymph to adult. Primitive insects like grasshoppers, crickets, and cockroaches grow from egg to larva, or from egg to nymph to adult. More advanced insects like beetles, butterflies, and bees grow from egg to larva to pupa to adult. So that's two different kinds of metamorphosis, two different ways that insects change as they grow. All right, this is a good stopping point. Before we start with the slides, now is a good time for a potty break if you need it, for questions. Uh, if you want to come take a closer look at these things, I've got them over here. You're welcome to come take a look. If you want to pass the taco to you around, you're welcome to. Let's, let's plan on a break for a bit, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, whatever. Snap questions, think of them, and we'll do them with the group. And throw questions at me if you need clarification. We're going to get, after the break, we'll get into a little quick review of what I just did, but then we'll get into the multiple insects. Oh, I didn't talk about the Beatles on the end there, so I got to mention it. Cool. No part. I went to the Brew Equinox area. I was out there in Pokemon Mono. Nice. It was a lot more. You were able to see it from the Sneaker Lodge. Uh huh. Gorgeous. I didn't get to go. My wife led a group of middle school students there, and I'd love to go, but not with a group potentially. I'm used to second graders, sixth graders. Century. At the CU Museum, we had a Volkswagen pinup like a ladybug called the Bucknell Gales. 
was a lot of fun. We're driving that whole spring around the state, waiting for a semi to run me over. Break <laughs> down at 3 in the morning. Hey, that's Audubon Society did that one too. Makes it even better. Yep. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's pretty good. There's some good ones out there. I've got some other books here that are off my shelf. Is there an insect collection here of the common insects in the area? We have a few in the closet. But not drawers of insects or anything weird. That'd be something that would be neat to do is make a collection of what's around here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, how can you kill those? Uh, there's an estimate that, that 5,000 insects are killed every day per mile of roads. Mm -hmm. Roadkill. So a lot more roadkill insect deaths than there are from collectors. No species is known to go extinct because of collectors. A lot of them gone extinct from habitat destruction. So we take a sample so we can tell what's out there. But we certainly don't drive them to extinction. So before we get started with the PowerPoint, anyone have any questions they want to answer now? Did the first part bring up any questions? Well, I have a question. I'm ready to get to it. That's fine. Uh, I have a butterfly garden that has no wood in it. I have not had those. I've never seen them. Do they have to be complained or do they do it on the wood? They usually go somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, and that's true with a lot of caterpillars. They will leave the caterpillar food plant, wander off somewhere, like under the eave of a roof or something, make their chrysalis there, and then uh, it's harder to find the chrysalis. Most species. There's some that will do the same. But sometimes found monarch chrysalis, sometimes on the underside of the milkweed leaf, but not very common. They'll go somewhere else. They wander. And when you see a caterpillar wandering somewhere away from a plant, it's probably getting rid of it. We'll leave our caterpillars not right away, they're they the uh, in winter, but some of them will warm. Right, well, I'm going to go ahead with the PowerPoint. Then. A lot of this is going to be review from what we just went through. Like, what is an arthropod? Again, the uh, jointed legs, arthro is joint, pod is leg or foot. So, and, and the names of the joints are the same ones we use for ourselves. That first part's the femur, next part, the tibia, the tarsi. And again, things like starfish or earthworms, they're not arthropods. They don't have the joint of legs. The other thing, the exoskeleton, meaning bones on the outside. A lot of times you might find an empty shell of an insect or uh, another arthropod, in this case a tarantula. And it looks like there's two of them there. But that clean, shiny one up top just crawled out of the dull exoskeleton from a <coughs> previous stage. Are those casings food for animals? Uh, not much to eat. They okay. mostly get blown around and break apart. Sometimes they will eat their own exoskeleton. Okay. Uh, but a lot of arthropods don't. And, uh, in the case of the spiders, you find an extra one sitting right there. So sometimes in a web, you'll find the empty skeleton of her last molt. And some will molt a certain set number of times, and others, like the arachnids, will keep molting once a year as they go on through life. The tarantulas will keep molting each year, whereas uh, most of the insects have a set number of molts that they'll go through. Like a mosquito has five molts during its lifetime. And, um, and they come out of it? They come way. out of it, yeah. Well, the mosquito adult does, and the larva does. Okay. The larva looks like a worm, and it has four stages like a worm, one stage is a pupa, and one stage is the adult. Mm -hmm. So only that last stage has wings and can fly. But that's the problem with having your bowls on the outside. If you get bigger, you can't grow because it, it keeps you in. So you have to shed the old bones, you grow new ones underneath. So when they first molt, their, their skeleton is very soft. And they have a certain amount of time to just blow themselves up as big as they can, taking water, taking air, taking whatever, to get as big as they can, and then they'll harden that way. And then that's as big as they're going to be until the next molt. And, and once they start outgrowing that suit of armor, they have to grow a new one. Um, and it happens underneath. So like in, in, in the collection of cockroaches, every now and then you see one that looks like an albino, it's bright white. It means it just molded. It hasn't had a chance to harden yet. It's not tan and turn brown. So if you see a bright white cricket out there, it's not an albino, it's just a fresh mold. So do all insects mold? All insects mold. Yeah, all insects have to go through stages of growth. And um, with the primitive insects, like the grasshoppers, crickets, and cockroaches, each molt just looks like a larger version of the one the night before it. The might are called the instar. Instar is the stage in between molts. So 
we say that mosquitoes have four instars of larvae, one pupa instar, and then the adult. So, joint legs, exoskeleton, and heterothermic, or cold-blooded. Hetero meaning different, thermic meaning temperature. We're homothermic, we mean the same temperature. We maintain our temperature. So you might see a butterfly sitting out in the sun to warm itself out. That black body down the middle of the thorax and abdomen, black absorbs the heat. So it's holding out, sitting with its wings out. It might even shiver its wings to get those muscles warm. But the solar gain from that black body is going to give its muscles enough heat so that it can fly. If you look at an ant nest, those big harvester ants, the big stone piles, notice where the entrance is. It's almost always on the southeast side of the nest because that's when the morning sun comes up. It's going to warm it up. So they'll stand at the entrance of the nest, get all warmed up before they go foraging for food. We should learn from this. The smart people have the entrance to the house on the south or east side of the house. <coughs> those who have it on the north side of the house had an architect that wasn't from Colorado. And those people are constantly chipping ice and trying to shovel the snow from their glacier that grows on the north side of the house. So smart people learn from the ants. But you'll see, you'll see insects on a cooler day or in the morning setting themselves to build up temperature because they're heterothermic. They can't hold in the body heat. So we talked about the five main classes. The Latin is insecta for the insects, arachnida for spiders and scorpions, crustacea for crab shrimp, the bugs. Chylopoda is the centipedes, referring to the one pair of legs. Di uh, diplopoda, or diplopoda, diplopoda is two pairs of legs. So the, the millipedes would be diplopods. It's enough of a Latin. So uh, with the insects, You've got the three body sections, the head, thorax, and the abdomen. You've got the six legs, and you've got the two antennas. So that's how you, you know an insect. So the butterfly is an insect. Sometimes you'll see butterflies that look like they only have four legs, like the painted lady butterflies. But there's actually six. The two front ones are called brush feet. And in this one family of butterflies, the monarchs are in that group too. The front legs are, are like brushes. They, they brush off their face with them, brush off their tail. So if you find a butterfly with four wings, it's not a mutant, or four legs rather, it's not a mutant, it's a member of the brush footed family. Look closely, you'll see the brushes up in the front of the face. This is not one, this is one that has the six walking legs. We see some later that don't. Okay, the arachnids are like the spider, two body sections, eight legs, no intent. The scorpions are in that same group, eight legs. Those two things on the front, the pincers, are actually part of their mouth, They're called penny pops. So they don't count as walking legs. If you count behind it, there's still eight legs on there. And then there's two penny tops in the front that are not legs. Glow in the dark, I love it. Mini groom, same thing. Uh, the two things in the front are actually the front legs. Those long, skinny things are not antennas, they're front legs. Again, the only venomous spider collar is a black widow. And that red spot on the belly, we used to say it's a red hourglass. You can't say that to kids. They don't know what an hourglass is. <laughs> the digital age, they think clockwise is blink, blink, blink. So I usually just say a red spot. That's not always hourglass shape. Sometimes when they get older, it looks like two red triangles. When they're younger, it looks like a, more of a blob. But there's a nice thing you with a good hourglass shape. And the outhouse three might miss where they bite. OK. Uh, I have a whole talk that I do on arthropod urban legends and myths. One of the myths out there is a black widow eats its mate. And they probably got the name Black Widow from a captive pair. Because after mating, the male uh, could be consumed if he has nowhere to run. And the female after mating is going to be hungry, you know, typical. She's done mating, she wants something to eat. She's going to eat the next thing that hits the web. Well, in a jar, the male has nowhere to go. Chances are he's the next thing to hit the web. And she's blind, she can't tell, she'll eat it. In, in the wild, he's going to bait and run away with the mate another day. So it's from a captive bred pair that they probably got the name Black Widow. It's one of those myths that they always eat their mate. And then that whole, my doctor said it was a brown recluse bite. If you see someone with a necrotic wound or something, don't believe it's a brown recluse unless it's a solid spider do it. It's really not fair to blame it on brown recluses. There's a guy at University of California, Riverside, who's done a whole study on false brown recluse cases. And uh, you know, it's fascinating things that are thought to be brown recluse bites by doctors. You know, we think of doctors as being so perfect and all because they've done all that studying and education. 
my father's a doctor, retired, <laughs> and I, I used to think he knew everything too, but the, the more really other human like us do, you can only fit a certain amount of stuff in your brain, and no one expects them to be a arachnologist. So occasionally we'll still get diagnoses and run through spikes here in Colorado. But uh, one of the things as environmental educators that we want to let people know is that they don't occur here naturally. Might come in with, with uh, stuff from Tennessee or something, but they're not going to survive very long because it's too dry. Um, but they have a bad reputation. Ants, cone nose bugs, kindergartners, they all have the same kind of bite. So don't believe it's a brown recluse. This is what a brown recluse looks like. Tan color. They, they say it's a dark violin shape on the cephalothorax. It looks more like a guitar to me. I don't know. But you can kind of see it on that left specimen there. It looks kind of guitar shaped. Um, very distinct pattern to it. But they're reclusive. The word brown recluse says it all. If you see a spider running around on the floor, it's not going to be a brown, brown recluse. They don't do that. They hide. They like the darkness. They like hidden places, cellars and stuff. That study that, that uh, Rick Vetter did, he went to a house in eastern Kansas where they found about 2,000 brown recluses in the house. The people who lived there were never, ever bit. Wow. Yeah. Because they're not aggressive. They don't go chasing people to bite them. They're reclusive. The name says it all. They're not the brown in your face. They're the brown recluse. <laughs> harvestman. Uh, Daddy long legs, mm -hmm. they call them sometimes. A harvestman is also an arachnid. Even though it looks like it only has one body section, uh, it's, it's two when, when you look at it microscopically. It, it is really two sections. They really do have eight legs. You'll hear people say that the daddy long legs is the most venomous spider in the world. They just can't open their jaws big enough to bite you, and that's it. That's a total no. They don't have venom legs. Uh, most of them are scavengers. Those that are predators go after small things like fruit flies. You don't need venom when you're catching fruit flies. So venom's expensive to make. Daddy long legs don't make them. And yeah, their jaws are too small to bite us. True, but they don't have venom. So that's one of those other myths that are out there. Arthropods are commonly the, the victim of bad press or, or urban legends and myths. Okay, next group, crustaceans. Yummy stuff, crab, lobster, crawdads, shrimp. They have 10 legs, four and 10. Uh, most of them live in water. Pill bugs and oily poles are also crustaceans. So a lot of people have eaten crustaceans, so we're real familiar with them in our diet. A lot of people have not eaten insects that uh, intentionally, but a lot of them are very nutritious. In other parts of the world, this is that palm leaf I was talking about from Colombia, where the kids will just go kill apart the trees looking for them, and they're very nutritious. And there's more and more work being done now uh, about trying to convince people that insects are a good source of protein. They're cheap, they're low on the food chain. Rather than raising cattle, we can raise insects with a fraction of the grain. A big bowl of oatmeal, you'll make enough. Uh, uh, enough mealworms to have a good pretzel mix or some, some uh, oatmeal cookies with the extra protein. And, and it'd be a great source of protein for people, but uh, it hasn't quite caught on <laughs> Really, shrimp, really lots, but we don't eat insects because we're grossed out by it. It's just the way we're brought up. Uh, people didn't used to eat potatoes either because it's a toxic plant. Why are you eating the root of this toxic plant? Rhubarb, a very toxic leaf, but we eat the stem. So once people realize that it's nothing toxic about it, some of them taste like chicken. <laughs> no, it tastes more nutty. Some of them are real nutty. You can make a pretzel mix. There are a couple very good chefs out there that focus on insects. One of them works in the Audubon Insectarium in New Orleans. You're going to go down there and have some of those chocolate chirp cookies or the pancakes that are featured on David Letterman's show. Uh, David George Gordon wrote a book on cooking with insects. His scorpion scallop king is to die for. This is phenomenal. So, if we can convince people that eating insects is not such a bad thing, we'll save acres and acres and acres of habitat. So, uh, yeah, think about that if you're grossed out by eating insects. Uh, <laughs> notice with uh, the FDA's regulations, it's maximum amount of insects, maximum number of insects per piece of whatever, chocolate, 60 insect fragments <laughs> per 100 grams. <laughs> Peanut butter, 30 insect fragments per 100 gram. It's a maximum level allowed in the food. There's no minimum level allowed. <laughs> you ever see a wheat field with combine harvesters going through? The grasshoppers flying in all directions. They don't all get away. If you look at a corn, uh, a corn silo, uh, there's, there's beetles and stuff in there too. 
some of the little black spots in your Fritos corn chips are, are delicious protein. <laughs> we try not to think about the way we're brought up. Um, but it's really not harming us at all. And, and the FDA acknowledges that there are always going to be some in there, but they, they put maximum limits on it just because we don't want to think about insects being in our food. And I had something else to say about that, and I totally forgot where I was going to go with that. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny. Yeah, it's like they do. They take samples of it. They look for pieces and parts. And, and if it's too much, it goes to cattle feed or pig slop or something like that. We eat it eventually. That way, too. It's processed. Anyway, kill bugs and really poison are also crustaceans. Centipedes that are carnivores with two legs on each body section and two antennas. Is it other bugs? Yeah, they're predators. Yeah, they'll eat other arthropods mostly. The big ones from South America get as long as my arm from elbow to wrist, as big around as my wrist. We had one we had to feed it mice. They'll eat lizards and stuff. But that thing, I'm so glad it never bit me because it was very <laughs> aggressive. And the jaws, were, I just saw how it took down the mice. It's just incredible. <laughs> Fortunately, they don't live here unless you have a Venezuelan exchange student living at your house. <laughs> Yeah, we do. Okay. The brown ones here, okay. well, the one I showed you, the tiger centipede, they live here. Okay. If we go up in Waterton Canyon and turn over some of the rocks, we'll find them. I find them on the railroad ties in Golden all the time. Yeah, there's some smaller ones that are all brown, okay. like this. Yeah. yeah. And their bite is also venomous, but they tiny little guys, that they're not going to bite you. They'll think there's something to crawl on. I don't recommend people hold them because they don't like to be held, but they're not going to hurt us the way the bigger ones would. But the tiger centipede do hurt when they bite. And then the millipedes. This is a Colorado millipede. Those pebbles are smaller than dimes. Even that big pebble is smaller than a dime. So it's just a tiny little thing. Tiny little legs on it. You can see the wave-like motion if your eyes are better than mine. But I'm getting old eyes, so I can't see them walk as well. But if you're out in the field, turn over a rock or a log and find one of these. Let it walk away, and one of the kids will be able to see that wave-like motion. But normally you find them in moist places, coiled up. Uh, like that. That's the way they tend to be. And that's to protect the, the delicate parts. The head, the belly are very vulnerable to predators, the legs. So they tuck that all inside and they tuck their head in. And then they'll exude those toxins. Point to that. So that they'll exude the toxin. Can see what I put. They'll exude the toxins out of the exoskeleton there. Oh, and then Valentine's Day. This is the most romantic there. Walking around arm and arm and arm and arm. <laughs> Are those the bottom of their feet, like little balls on the bottom of their feet? Yeah, no, just the joints of the legs. They're jointed legs. Yeah. Uh, but the, the body, the, the gonopods, the, the reproductive organs are the eighth segment down. And so the, the male exudes this thing that looks like goo, that looks like jelly. And that's what he insert, inserts inside the female. And so they have to be coupled right against each other like that. They'll, they'll hold hands for a long time while they're copulating. Okay, well, this is a question I get asked most often. What, what good are bugs? And my answer is always the same. What good are we? What good are we? Because we could disappear tomorrow and the world would go on just the same way it always has, maybe even better without us, a lot of diversity and stuff. If the, all the arthropods were to disappear, all the insects were to disappear, the world would be just green goo. There'd be some algae that would here still, but pretty much all the flowering plants would die. A lot of the, uh, all the, all the vertebrates would die, certainly without the insects. So they run the world, they just let us live here. You, you've heard talk about the, the, the geologic eras, the age of fishes, the age of reptiles, the age of mammals, and it's been the age of insects all the way through. Of course, microbiologists would say it's been the age of bacteria all the way through. Uh, most of our body is made up of bacteria cells and our human cells. But uh, if you're looking at something bigger than the bacteria, it's really been the age of insects ever since uh, life on Earth came around. Uh, well, a little bit later than that, but you know, <laughs> multicellular life. The stuff we think of as animals, the insects are definitely in charge. And they play a lot of roles in, in, the, in the ecosystem. You've got some that are pollinators, very important role that they serve as far as the plants are concerned. And you'll see them gathering around the butterfly garden here in the summertime. Lots of different insects serve the role of pollinator. Some as both. And so they're, they're an integral part of almost every food chain 
on the planet, you'll find arthropods in it. You've got a variety of different uh, lifestyles. The herbivores eat just the plants, the omnivores will eat anything, carnivores just predators. And a lot of things that we think of as being herbivores really have some other protein in their diet. Most vegetarians I know eat insects, they just don't realize it. Um, cows eat insects when they're eating the grass, they get some insects too. So they, they're a protein source for even those things that think of themselves as vegetarian. Chatfield, here we are, post-1965. When I was a kid, that wasn't there. So when we think of the habitats around this area, most of what we see is artificial. It's man-made. This is a nature area, not a natural area. Mm -hmm. uh, even back in 65, before the 65 flood, there was a lot of human uh, intervention in this area. There was a lot of human habitat alterations in this area. Uh, the reason it's called Chatfield, it was a ranch, the Chatfield family ranch. And uh, they had a lot of cattle on this land. Some of it was overgrazed. That's why you see a lot of yucca plants and things like that that you find when they've been overgrazed. Prickly pear was most common before food grazing. Uh, so a lot of natural prairie grasses are gone. A lot of the natural insects are gone. Uh, this is what it looked like in 1820. Uh, Waterton Canyon, when the Long Expedition came through here, that's the drawing they drew of it, the Platte River coming out of Waterton, in that narrow area where it gets deep. Uh, now most of that water is diverted before it gets to Waterton Canyon. And so we don't see the Platte flow like that anymore. But that's what it was in 1820. Is that the picture you were about? Yeah, that's a favorite picture of mine too. This is a little closer to what it would have looked like here back before 1965. This is a ranch. There were cattle on the ranch. Lots of grasses. Some of the native prairie grasses still. If you go a little further back, you would have found prairie chickens here and prairie dogs. We still have some. There were bison here. And now less so. And a lot of times you'll hear people say that wetlands are the best kind of natural area, the best kind of nature area, because of the high diversity in the wetlands. I think it depends on who you are as to whether it's the best area. Uh, we created a huge wetland here in the Great Riparian Area, which is great if you're a duck, but it's not so great if you're a field mouse or a field cricket. Uh, you can't swim. Field crickets don't swim. It's great if you're a mosquito. We've got mosquitoes here that we never would have had back in the old days. Uh, so it's a great place for mosquitoes now. Yeah, she's laying eggs there on the water. That's one of the West Nile carrying mosquitoes. They lay their eggs right on the water, whereas the Nuisance mosquitoes tend to lay their eggs on the mud. I like to spend days talking about mosquitoes. I won't go into mosquitoes in too much detail. <laughs> Some of the other insects that are common here that might not have been as common in the past are wetland animals like the dragonflies. The dragonflies are among the most primitive insects that you'll see here at Chatfield. Uh, unless you go into leaf litter and, and look at some of the leaf litter under a microscope. But of the, of the larger insects, you'll see dragonflies are common. They can't close their wings. They're stuck out like that. They can't fold them. So that's how you tell a dragonfly. They, they, they sit their wings outstretched. And the males will tend to defend territories. They'll perch on a plant and wait for the females to come by. They'll chase away the other males. And that's why they come back to the same spot. So if you see one sitting on a twig and it flies off, just wait a little bit. It'll come back because it's defending that territory. And it'll find a female to mate with. There's the nymph in the water. And then when the nymph is mature, it will climb up on a emergent vegetation, and the adult will climb out of the old exoskeleton. So that's why you see those shells sitting on the, on the reeds every now and then. That's the exoskeleton of the nymph stage. So it's already molted several times as a nymph, each one getting bigger and bigger. The last molt, it grows its wings and it spreads out. You take a lot of those nymphs out of the pond when you are pond looking. Yeah, cool. And they're cool too. they got these lower jaws that shoot out and grab food. It's like a big spoon. So it sits under their lower jaw. So if, if you have some prey in there with it, you might see it sit out their lower lip every now and then. It's really fun to watch. There's a nymph from one of the gonfid species, the ones that are flat in the mud. So we have several different kinds of dragonflies here. Some are flat and chubby in the mud. Others are kind of skinny and long and they'll be on the, on the vegetation underneath the pond. And then when they're ready to become adults, when their last molt comes, they'll climb out. There's uh, one of the larger species here, the blue darner. Uh, big species, big as my hand, pretty much. 
uh, is common in this area. And there's that life cycle, the complete life cycle. The egg is laid in the water, the nymph lives underwater, comes out, emerges as an adult. And that adult doesn't molt again after that. Once it grows its wings, it's as big as it will get. Um, as a nymph, sometimes two or three years underwater. Yeah, and the adult is usually just a month or two. Some adults live longer. There are some that are migratory, and they fly great, great distances. Very little is known about where they're migrating to and from, but they'll fly continent distances, uh, just like a monarch bird flies and other migratory animals. But there's not a lot understood about them. Damselflies are related to dragonflies, but their wings fold. So they'll look like a dragonfly, but their wings will fold back and put their body at rest. Okay, grasshoppers, they have that same life cycle as the dragonflies. They can complete metamorphosis from egg to nymph to adult. They'll lay their eggs, most of them in the soil. The nymph looks just like a miniature grasshopper with stubby little wings. And then when they're full grown, they, they grow the long wings. Crickets are the same group with the grasshoppers, uh, the noise makers of the insect world, the music of the night. Only the males make that noise. The males are the ones that chirp, the females are silent. The noise serves two purposes. It calls out to the other males saying, hey, this is my territory. It also calls out to the females, hey, babe, I'm over here. And the female will go to whichever male makes the best song. So you see the males getting next to uh, uh, drain gutters. Uh, because it echoes, echoes, echoes. The danger of that is the predators and the parasites are listening for the same sound. So that male's taking his chances, but if he doesn't reproduce, his life is for nothing. So he's willing to risk the predator or parasite finding him. But I would think with the echo chamber like a grain gutter, the female will be able to find him. I don't know. This, yeah. The crickets, this is not a male, this is a female. You see that sword sticking out of the tail? That's called the ovipositor or an egg layer. That's where the eggs come out of. Mormon cricket. Mormon crickets are the, the ones that uh, you can find them in high altitude. Uh, on the western slope, they're in huge numbers sometimes to the point where they'll cause a road to slip on the ground. Because when one dies, gets run over, the others will come to the funeral and they'll get run over too. And <laughs> Get a slick there. Sometimes it's such huge numbers. They're called the Mormon cricket because when Brigham Young brought uh, the people out to Utah, their first sets of crops were destroyed by these crickets. And that's why the seagull is the state bird of Utah. The seagulls came and they ate the, the crickets. It's, a, it's not a grasshopper, it's got long antennas. Grasshoppers have stubby antennas. Crickets and katydids have the long antennas. So this is related to the crickets. This is a, a grasshopper you'll find here called the barber pole grasshopper. One of the prettier species in the Denver area. Yeah. They don't like water as much, so you got to get into the drier areas of the chat field to find them. But I've seen them over in the Botanic Gardens area before, so I think they're down here too. We'll look for them this summer. Some of them are very well camouflaged. This is my Valentine's Day top slide, too. I guess. Even when they're mating, the pattern stays the same. So it breaks up the pattern by having the banding. And the band continues from the male to the female on this. I think it's pretty cool. The male's a little guy on top, the female rear on the bottom. So really cool stuff. Katydids are also very well camouflaged. Katydids are the ones that look just like leaves. We have a species here that's quite common now. It wasn't common uh, 150 years ago because we didn't have a lot of trees here. Now we have a lot of trees, and this thing's been able to do quite well. Uh, again, the males make a the noise, the females are silent. The males make a clicking noise, a click, click, clicking noise. Usually around September you'll hear them. But they're very well camouflaged. You'll hear them before you see them in most cases. But they do come to light sometimes at night. So you might see them on your porch light or on the wall or something. And these are their eggs. Those little watermelon seed like look at things much tinier than a watermelon seed, of course. But uh, that's what a looks like. So even their eggs are camouflaged. Really fantastic. One of the best camouflage insects in Colorado is the stick insects. Have you seen them here at Chatfield? Yeah. Usually I can't find them, but if you bring your kid out in the field, you can spot them. Uh, you gotta wait until one of them moves. But here's a <laughs> stick insect here on this uh, buckwheat, I think it is, right? False buckwheat. Yeah. And here's a, the female's green, the male's brown. Um, 
That's uh, the Colorado stick insect. It's one of the more common stick insects in this part of the country. But they're hard to find. There's a place out uh, near Rogan on the way to Fort Morgan where you find in the sand hills near Rogan. There's a bunch of them there. like the sandy soil there. But related to the grasshoppers, they have the incomplete metamorphosis also. There's a close up of one. Praying mantis, they're related to those grasshoppers and cockroaches as well. Uh, this is the Chinese mantis. And it's a myth, another one of those myths. The female does not have to eat the mate in order to survive. Notice how far back the male is on this female. He doesn't want to get eaten. He's going to stay way back there. When he's done mating, he's out of there as quick as he can. Now, if his prospects are such that he doesn't think he's going to find another mate, he might lay down in front of her and let her eat. But if he's got any chance at all of living long enough to mate again, he thinks he might be able to, to, to get a chance, he's going to run. So they have been seen to eat their mates. And it's usually a male that thinks his life is over already. And maybe you'll hear about, well, if he loses his head, he'll keep mating. And yeah, that's true. They don't need their head to mate. Most guys don't. <laughs> and, like that. Um, and so they, they, they'll keep mating when they're um, especially when they're going to die because they know they're, well, they don't know they're going to die. Their body no longer has any inhibitors. The inhibitors are all in the head, um, and so the body doesn't have anything to stop it. So that are really well camouflaged. This is an orchid mantis from Malaysia. They have purple like orchid flowers. Very well camouflaged. Absolutely gorgeous. A lot of camouflage things that look like mantis, but they're not. This one is called uh, uh, an ambush bug. Ambush bug you'll see on the yellow flowers and the white flowers in the fall, especially late in the summer. Those are really big front legs for grabbing on the bees or flies that come up to the flower. So they'll sit camouflaged on the flower, and a bee or a fly will come right next to it. And it's got the big, strong front legs to hold on it. Remember, these guys have exoskeletons. So when you see a big body part, it usually means there's big muscle underneath it. And these are really strong. I've seen them take down butterflies and bees much larger than themselves. So watch for the ambush bugs on the, the flowers in the fall. And I, I use the word bug. These are true bugs. When an entomologist refers to a bug, he's not referring to all the insects. A bug is a certain group of insects, a certain order of insects. And they have these sucking mouth parts. They have this beak that they use for piercing and sucking. So they pierce into their food item, whether if they're predators, it's another animal. If they're herbivores, it's a plant. And they'll suck the juices out of that, that organism. Another way to tell the true bugs, their scientific name is hemiptera. Terra meaning wing, hemi meaning half. It's like a half wing. The front part is leathery like a beetle, and the back part is membranous and very, very soft. So it forms like an X, because their wings sit overlapped against each other. The membranous parts overlap, and the, the thick part doesn't. So it looks almost like an X. So those black cylinder bugs that are running around all over the place here, look out closely. You'll see the X pattern on the back. They're true bugs. <coughs> the beak is long and skinny for sucking those box elder seeds. They'll pierce it into one. Yeah, here's a good one. Yeah, you can see that X pattern if you look real close. And so they're true bugs. When the scientist refers to a bug, it's a true bug with the piercing, sucking mouth parts and the X pattern. So the assassin bugs, you'll see on the flowers out there too. Like the ambush bugs, they'll lie in wait for something to fly in, like a pollinator and they'll grab it and they'll eat it and they'll pierce it with that beak to suck the juices out. Box elder bugs. Sometimes you find huge numbers of them. And here you see the incomplete metamorphosis. The nymphs don't have the wings. They get a little older, they get little wing pads on them, and then the adults have that X pattern of the complete wing. So there's several stages of them. This picture was taken on a fence right next to a box elder tree. You've got box elder trees in here. So you'll find all stages of them around the trees. Uh, as the season gets later, you'll only find the adults generally on a south-facing wall. So I'm sure this wall over here is covered with them on warm days. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they don't hibernate the way a lot of overwintering against uh, animals would. They'll uh, shut down their body systems in a sheltered place. But on a warm day, a January thaw day, they'll go out and look for water or something to drink. And uh, they'll, you'll find them on those south-facing walls in huge numbers. My mom freaks out. And here are these bugs in her house in Baker's, in her home. And you squish them, and they just leave a red stain there. So you got red stains all over. But best just to pick them up and let them outside. 
there's a, a nymph on a box, cell, uh, box cellar seed, the little eggs on the seed, the nymph coming out. Yeah, cute little guys. Another home invader are these conifer seed bugs. Some people call them leaf-footed bugs. That's another species of bug that overwinters as an adult. So when you overwinter as an adult, you've got to find shelter uh, from the cold. This is too cold to be out flying around. There's no food to eat anywhere. These guys feed on conifer seeds. Uh, it's the name conifer seed bug. They also like green beans if you want some in captivity. And they'll come inside. They used to go find hollow trees or caves or under rocks and stuff. And now we've got these houses, garages, and stuff. A house is not a good place for black cellar bugs or leaf footed bugs because it's too dry in our houses and too warm. They need to find a place where they stay cold enough that their metabolism is always going. They're not burning up their fat storage. If they live off the fat stored in their body. So that's a true bug, a leaf footed bug that's a house invader. Now, closely related to the true bugs, and sometimes grouped with them, are things like uh, leaf hoppers, cicadas, spittle bugs. Cicadas are the ones that make the buzz, buzz, buzz noise in the trees. Uh, uh, if you go back east during certain years, it's so loud that it, it feels like you're going to go deaf from the noise. But they make, they call them locusts back east because of the plague of them everywhere. Out west, what we refer to as a locust is a migratory grasshopper. Back east, a locust is uh, a cicada. So that's another reason why English names aren't always the best. Uh, scientists will use Latin names a lot of times for things because it's going to be the same no matter where you go in the world. Whereas here, what we call a water strider down in Texas, they call a Jesus bug. So it depends on where you're from. Well, if you say locust to someone out west, we refer to plagues of giant migratory grasshoppers. Out east, they refer to plagues of these Cicadas. So it's uh, the common names are for different animals in different places sometimes. So yeah, the school bugs are negative too. But they're plant sucking bugs. Now sometimes you'll see an insect like this, especially at the lights, you'll say, wow, that looks like a dragonfly. But if you look closely, dragonflies have stubby little antennas. This thing has two long antennas. And they're in the next group. This is the most primitive of the insects that have the complete life cycle. So now we're done with the primitive insects that have the incomplete life cycle. We're getting into the more advanced insects that have the complete life cycle. And this is the more primitive of those. This is called an antlion. And we're not used to seeing this stage very often unless you're collecting at lights at night. Normally, we see just a pit in the ground, in the sand. Especially along the eaves of buildings, along the sides of buildings, sandy areas next to rocks, you might see a pit in the sand. And if an ant falls into this pit, all of a sudden, jaws are going to come out, kicking the sand up. And that's the, the nymph, I mean, I'm sorry, just the larva of the ant line, that's little jawed creature here. The big jaws are hollow, and that's what's at the bottom of that pit. So it goes through the complete life cycle. This larva looks nothing like the adult. Whereas with the incomplete life cycle of primitive insects, the nymph looks a lot like the adult. Now we're in the advanced insects where the larva doesn't look like the adult, it doesn't eat the same stuff as the adult. And that's one thing that makes it more advanced is the, lar the larvae don't compete with the adults for with incomplete metamorphosis, the nymph often eats the same thing the adult eats, like a grasshopper. They're feeding on the same stuff. So the parents are actually competing with their own kids. With the complete life cycle, they don't. This guy eats uh, ants or other insects that fall into the pit, whereas the adult, I think, feeds on nectar for most of them, most of the adult ant plants. So anyway, watch for those. Find one of those pits, drop an ant in it or something like that, and watch the way they pray, and then take a spoon and dig it out. If you're really quick, get it before it digs in because they're very fast diggers and then you can see this little jaw thing. You might think you only got sand in your spoon, but kind of shake it a bit and see if it moves around because they're very well camouflaged against the sand. They look just like it. <coughs> they're fun to dig up with kids. Okay, complete metamorphosis. The butterflies also go through complete metamorphosis as we talked about. Uh, if you guys want, we can take a break here now too. I don't want to go through too much. We got. Do you guys want to take a break? We'll keep going. They always say attention spans 20 minutes, mine's about three. Um, <laughs> if, if, if we need to stop, let me know. Okay. So let's look at the butterfly's complete metamorphosis. The adult lays eggs. So this is a, the tiger swallowtail. This is the largest kind of butterfly we have native to Colorado. And it'll lay its eggs on green ash. That's one of the common species that we'll see it on. It'll also lay its eggs on choke cherry. And that's and it's most butterflies, and a lot of insects in general, are very specific about where they lay their eggs. 
the tiger swallowtail is laying its eggs on ash because that's the caterpillar food plant. The caterpillar is adapted just to feed on that or choke cherry, certain kinds of plants. So mom's not there to take care of the kids. She'll lay her eggs on a place where the kid can find food when it hatches out. I'd be like if my mom were to, uh, uh, if I would have been born into a bowl of cereal or something, I'd just roll over for your first meal. This guy, once it comes out of the egg, hatches out. <coughs> it'll chew up the eggshell and then it'll start eating the leaves. Remember I mentioned before that tiger swallowtails look just like bird poop when they hatch out of the egg? Yeah, kind of. When they get a little bigger, the next moment they look a lot more like bird poop. Yeah, and some of the tropical species look like a bird just took a dump. And, uh, so it's good adaptation. Um, a lot of predators will look for chewed leaf, chewed leaves, because they know there's food to eat there. <coughs> so a lot of times you'll see them try to eat an entire leaf, but when they're done, if they haven't finished the leaf, they'll go move somewhere else. They're not going to stay on a leaf like this. This is a posed picture, probably, for a captive one, because that's a dangerous spot to be. But looking like bird poop, maybe the predators will leave below. <coughs> a lot of times, you can't find them just by looking for chewed leaves, because after they're done chewing, they're going to move away, so the predators can't find them either. As the tiger swallowtail gets bigger, its coloration changes a little bit. And this is one that's just getting ready to wander off and form its chrysalis. And um, they have a neat adaptation for defense when they're that age. They have these little horns that come out called osmeterium that stink really bad. And a bird doesn't want to go back to the nest with bad breath or smelly fur or <laughs> feathers or something, and so they'll leave them alone. So if you ever find a tiger swallowtail caterpillar like this, or the black swallowtails do the same thing, kind of tickle it on the back, and these things will come out and stink really bad. And so that's a great defense. Anyway, the next molt is the chrysalis. And with the tiger swallowtail, the chrysalis is standing straight up and down. They have this little silk band to hold it that way. Others, like the monarch, will make a silk button up high, and they'll form the chrysalis below that hanging upside down. So the swallowtails are right side up, with the head up, and the, a lot of butterflies have the head down, and they make the chrysalis. But again, the chrysalis is not sleeping. It's changing. The worm-like caterpillar was a feeding machine. The adult is a mating machine. with changing their shape and their behavior inside that chrysalis. How long they stay in the chrysalis depends on the species. A lot of tropical ones will just be a few days in the chrysalis. Even some of the ones here, a few days in the chrysalis. Those that overwinter as a chrysalis, they'll have to find a sheltered place to make that chrysalis, to mold into that chrysalis. Uh, but then inside there, their body is almost like a glycerin type compound, an antifreeze. And so they don't freeze, they, their body won't freeze inside them. And uh, the caterpillar cells break down and reform as the adult cells. And a lot of it's mysterious. We're not totally sure what regulates it. There's hormones involved that regulate it. And there's leftover parts that aren't used in the adult. And there's parts that were not in the caterpillar that are created new in the adult. So there's a lot of transformation going on in that chrysalis. And then out comes the adult butterfly. In the case of the swallowtail, they spend the chrysalis as a winter, and they spend the winter as a chrysalis, they'll come out in the spring. And then they might go through a couple generations in the summer. So that the, the eggs that are laid in the spring, they'll go through their caterpillar stage, then the pupa only for a few days, and then the adult flies again. So you'll see some tiger swallowtails in the spring, you'll see another burst of them around the time the monsoons later in the summer. And if you have a really warm year, you might get a third generation of them. And then that last generation in the fall when they make a chrysalis they stay in the chrysalis until winter. And what triggers them to remain a chrysalis as to opposed to hatching out as an adult? Not really sure. Uh, it's a hormone thing, but it's got to be temperature related. And some people say it's daylight link also related. So it depends on the species. A lot of people ask me what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? And scientists don't separate. We group them all together as Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera, terra again meaning wing, lepido referring to scales. So the wings have scales on them. Here's micro oh, I'm not telling you about it. No. Uh, the scales are microscopic. They look like shingles on the roof. They overlap like shingles on a roof, too. And that gives them the patterns that we see. And it also gives them some aerodynamic capability. You know, there are a lot of people say, if you rub the powder off a butterfly, this is the powder, this is these scales. Rub it off a butterfly, they can't fly. And that's not quite true. They can't fly as well, maybe because they don't have that aerodynamics from the overlapping shingles, but they can still fly. And the glass wing butterfly is an example of that. Its scales came off when it came out of the chrysalis, and that's why it looks clear. They can still fly. 
but they can't recognize their mates as well. They're using visual cues to tell the mates apart. And also, as well as chemical cues they can smell. But also, the predators, they use these uh, scales for patterns that have adaptive value, as we talked about before, things like deception, where the eye spot fools them, things like camouflage. It's one of my favorite insects in the world, the, the dead leaf butterfly from Asia. In fact, my company name, uh, my consulting company is Kalima Consultants. This is the Kalima butterfly. Uh, when its wings are open, it's bright purple and orange on the inside. They're very well camouflaged on the outside. The reason that's the name of my company is when we were developing the butterfly pavilion, uh, I went to Callaway Gardens uh, when it was a new exhibit, and I looked at this $5 million building, and I'm thinking, there's no way in the world we're ever going to be able to build a building like this. And I sat on a bench all discouraged, thinking the butterfly project here in Colorado was doomed. And this Kalima butterfly sits on my shoulder for about 30 minutes, it whispers in my ear, if you will, that we will go. <laughs> so, okay, we'll do it, forget away. And so I give that butterfly a lot of credit, but it's camouflage. You can't find them until they open their wings. And the males will sit there with their wings open, uh, attracting the females. But if there's any danger at all, they close their wings or they fly off and close their wings. And it's really hard to find them because you're cued in on looking for something else. It's fun to go hunting for Colorado Hair Street butterflies, the same reason. You see that flash of purple when they fly out from an oak leaf, and then that, their caterpillars feed on oak, so they're always around the oak bushes. So if you go to Daniels Park or Tiny Town, look in the scrub oak in July, and they have some around here too. There's some scrub oak. Yeah, Roxbow's got scrub oak, and, and I think there's some down further on the some of the pale, trails here too. I think we saw some scrub oak. So there might be uh, the Colorado Hair Street down here too. But you'll watch if you ever scare some of them up with your net. You'll see the purple flash, and then they'll disappear when they land. So well camouflaged. And then some display the warning coloration. Just like I explained with the, the postman butterfly that, that uh, uh, feeds on passion vine, the monarch butterfly is the classic example of a toxic butterfly. It feeds on milkweed, which is a toxic plant. While uh, the toxins in the milkweed are not uh, dangerous to the, the monarch, they sequester those toxins in their own body so that if you eat a monarch, you're going to get sick and throw up like tuna casserole. <laughs> monarchs are neat. I, I could do a whole talk just on monarch butterflies because they are so cool. They overwinter as adults, but not here. It's too cold for them here. And so they'll fly to places where they can spend the winter. And they're looking for very specific things. There's groves of trees along the Monterey Peninsula and down into, towards Los Angeles. And then there's groves of trees in central Mexico. And if you ever get a chance, you've got to go see these places in between November and March are the best times to go. These areas are very specific because they're cool enough that the butterfly sleeps most of the winter. It, it shuts down its body and, and, and lives off the fat in its body. If they're too warm, the butterfly is going to be too active and they're going to burn up all the fat storage and they're not going to survive through the winter. So you've got to have that combination warm enough that they don't freeze to death, but cold enough that they don't use their body very much during the winter. And so these two places have those, those aspects to them, that they won't freeze, but they'll survive the winter. And if, if you go to Monterey, the Pacific Grove, there's groves of trees with 16,000 monarch butterflies in them. If you go to central Mexico, you can see 6 million butterflies at all the time. What kind of trees are uh, It used to be in California, they were on the pine trees, but the eucalyptus have taken their place. So now you find them on eucalyptus groves in California, which is not a native tree, but they've adapted. Pine trees and forests are gone, they, they make do with the eucalyptus. In central Mexico, it's almost all pine. And uh, to, to, I was there in, in Mexico in February one time on a sunny day. And in the morning, they're all clustered in the trees. It looks kind of like this. When the sun comes out, they open their wings. And they fly to the meadow to get something to drink. If they can find some sugar to eat, nectar or something, all the better. But usually, they just find water to drink. It feels like orange snow. These wings just going past you, and, and just you're covered with butterflies. You gotta watch where you walk because they're everywhere. If you ever get a chance to go to Central Mexico and check this out, it's one of those phenomena that's disappearing. It's for a couple reasons. There's a cluster with the wings still close. The forests around the forests where the butterflies will winter are preserves, but the forests around them are not. And the forests around them can serve as buffers from the temperature. So now more and more every year you're seeing snow episodes where the snow is actually making it into those inner forests. And uh, uh, 
So a lot of them are, are dying from habitat destruction uh, in the central Mexico area. So this phenomenon is going to disappear. Monarchs are not going to go extinct. There will be some places where monarchs can live here all around. Like Southern Florida, they live here around. Southern Texas, they live here around Arizona. But the migration is probably going to disappear. Uh, maybe we'll be able to preserve it in California. Another reason isn't just the habitat destruction in Mexico. We can't point the finger at them. We can point the finger at us as well. Because bluegrass lawns don't have milkweed in them. Uh, we have some milkweed along the highways, but the huge fields of milkweed that might have existed 150 years ago are gone. And so, and even where I live up in Portland, we grew this butterfly garden, and I got cited for weed violation because the, the code enforcement people saw milkweed on our land, and that's a weed. It says right there in the name, milkweed. So I had to train the city people about um, butterfly gardening and how just because it has the name weed in it doesn't mean it's a weed, it's a host plant. So by not having enough host plant up north here, we're leading to the habitat destruction too. So I always encourage people to get rid of their grass, grow a butterfly garden. Now I know this doesn't look natural. It's not natural. A lot of plants, this is not my yard by the way, this is my yard. yard. Mine never looks this good. These people water up a lot more than I do. Mine is zero escaped because I'm uh, too cheap to pay for water, too lazy to go around watering, and you know, dead or native, I want to keep it zero escape. But uh, a lot of them are non native plants, but the butterflies love them. And you notice how there are clusters of the same kind of plant, which you wouldn't find in nature. They'd be scattered about, each plant scattered around. You wouldn't find clusters of one kind of plant. But, I like to think of it as a bag of m ms in a way. Yeah, a lot of butterflies like to specialize on certain kinds of plant. And if you scatter their favorite plant all over the place, it'd be like if I scattered a bag of m ms all over the room. There's your bag of m ms go find it. Uh, it you, much before I give you a bag of m ms probably too. And that's the same thing we do. If you give a cluster of plants, you're going to give more food for the butterflies that it's easier for them to find. They're not going to have to work so hard for it. And they're more likely to stick around your garden. The other thing you got to provide is food plant for the caterpillars. Just having nectar for the adults isn't good enough. The caterpillars eat different things. The monarch butterfly, its caterpillars feed on milkweed. Here's the morning cloak butterfly. Its caterpillars are known as the spiny elm caterpillars because their caterpillars feed on elm trees. And so there's some elms near here. You might find these little caterpillars, the black and red spiny things. They, they're in clusters usually with several caterpillars together. The morning cloak is one of those ones that overwinter right here in Colorado as an adult. If you go out walking the paths during the January thaw day, you might see a morning cloak actually flying around in the middle of January on the wall. It's going to be a warm day, looking for water or for food, uh, any kind of sweet substance. They don't find much at this time of year. Fortunately, it's cold enough that they mostly sleep. They'll find a hollow tree or uh, even a culvert or a shed or somewhere like that to spend the winter. So it's one of the few butterflies that overwinters in the Gulf, right here in Colorado. Uh, the caterpillars feed on elm. The fritillaries, their caterpillars feed on violets. So if you have some award-winning violets in your butterfly garden, you might lose a few to the caterpillars. That's the way it goes, but a uh, good plant for them. The painted lady butterfly, its caterpillars will feed on mallow, but also thistle. Some of these exotic thistle plants that are coming in here that have been introduced by people, the caterpillars of the painted ladies are, are feeding on. Painted ladies have a strange sort of migration. They don't have a two-way migration. They have more of an immigration. They spend the winter in the Sonoran area of the southwestern U.S. in New Mexico. And then they'll go through several life cycles during the winter time. Caterpillar, egg larva, adult, you know, I remember, egg larva, uh, pupa, and adult. They'll go through the cycle of the Sonora. And then when it gets towards springtime, they're starting to run out of caterpillar food plant. And they migrate north looking for more food plants for their caterpillars. In some years, we get huge mass migrations of large numbers of painted lady butterflies. And the second graders raise these things in their classrooms, so you always get a call from the second graders. Did we do that? Are we responsible for all this? That's not no, <laughs> migrating north from the Sonora. And they repopulate North America every year from these migrating ones coming north. But in the fall, they don't go back the other direction. It's just one gen uh, generation moving north, multiple generations up here, and then those that came up here die off. Kind of like a lemming situation, I guess. But if the uh, predictions for global climate change go as is, each year they'll be able to get further and further north. Uh, and, and at one time, maybe 5,000 years ago, during the Ipsy Thermal, they probably did spend the winter further and further north. Uh, they didn't go as far south. 
uh, 5,000 years ago is a lot warmer than it is now. We didn't have the tree line that we have today. The tundra was gone, which forest went all the way up to the top of some of our mountains 5,000 years ago. So we've had it warmer than this before. Um, and we're not going to stop the ice age. It'll get colder than this before. So a lot of these butterflies that have migrations like that, that's a change in their distribution that's based on climate change. So when we had the glaciers, there were no milkweed, uh, there was no milkweed up here, so there were no monarchs up here. As the glaciers receded, the milkweed moved further north, the monarchs were able to move further north as well. But they had to go back south to spend the winter. The painted ladies haven't adapted that to that return trip because they keep enough population to be out of Sonora every year. So, so what happens to the monarchs? In the, so they go to Mexico, yeah. and then they open the adults, the cyclone, yeah. the no, uh, they, the adults just sit down there okay. and overwork you. Okay. And then when it's spring comes, their mate is right there. That's the nice thing about me, uh, that overwintering in a cluster. You don't have to go far to find your mate. So they'll mate. The males will probably die there for the most part. The females will fly north, maybe as far as Texas, lay their eggs, get the caterpillar six weeks, the pupa a couple days, 10 days, then the adult that emerges in Texas flies further north. Maybe gets as far as Minnesota. Lays its eggs, caterpillar, pupa, adult, fly further north into Canada. Lay their eggs, caterpillar, pupa, adult. Now it's getting to be September. Getting to be too cold. They'll be starting to disappear. Magnetism is changing, light changing, temperature changing. Stuff going on in their heads says, I'm not, I'm not mature. To, they, 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 don't have, they don't have the ability to make. They're not reproductively mature. Even though they have all the parts as an adult, they're not able to mate. And hormones trigger whether they're able to mate or not. If they're not able to mate, what do they do? They fuel up on nectar, tons of nectar. And they fly south, stopping at butterfly gardens, nectar plants, and everything they can fuel up on, building their fat body so that they can survive the winter down in Mexico or on the California coast. So you see some chunky looking monarchs <laughs> flying south in the wind. You wonder how can this fat thing get off the ground? <laughs> and and it, it'll burn up a lot of that fuel. And it, it's got to have nectar all the way down. And so part of the reason they're disappearing also is the nectar is disappearing. Bluegrass doesn't have nectar. So if you plant a butterfly garden, have some rabbit brush or something in there for them to feed on in the fall. The goldenrod, the, the, all the great yellow things that are out there in the fall, that's the nectar for the southern migrating monarchs. Not as big a deal here as it is in the places where they're more common, but um, that's partly why they're disappearing because they don't have fuel for the routes south. Here's the orange sulfur butterfly common here at Chatfield. Its caterpillars feed on alfalfa. Black swallowtails, their caterpillars feed on, on uh, Queen Anne's lace in the wild. They captive deal feed on parsley and dill, and sometimes in huge numbers. You get a lot of caterpillars on your dill if you're making pickles. We want to grow extra dill. We grow some for them, some for us. And so if I find them on my dill plants, I move them back over to theirs. And that way, I get pickles every year, and they'll dill for my pickles, and they have caterpillars. And what one is this? This is the black swallowtail. Yeah. It looks like the tiger swallowtail, mostly black. And then the caterpillars, they have those little osmeterium too. You tickle these guys, they'll have the osmeterium come out and sleep really bad. They look like bird poop when they first hatch out. So if you see bird poop on your parsley, uh, don't eat it. Yes. Okay. Don't see the blacks as often, but if you plant dill or parsley in your yard, you'll see them. Yeah. There's the adult. That's what the adult with black swallowtail looks like. Cabbage whites, the European import. We feed it cabbage, broccoli, so they're all over the place. If you, if you go to a restaurant, you can get a piece of broccoli with a caterpillar in it. It looks kind of like this, the little green caterpillars. A little extra protein, it won't hurt you. But uh, a lot of times, the place that really good, fresh, organic produce, you'll find them too in the broccoli. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have that than pesticides all over my broccoli, too. So it's a good sign when you have caterpillars. But that's why we have so many European cabbage whites. We, we have a lot of plants that we grow for food that they eat. So you can tell when you've got an organic alfalfa field because the orange sulfurs will be all over tell when you've got organic cabbage patch or organic broccoli field because you'll see the cabbage bugs all over. And some of the native plants in that same family, the crucifer family, uh, you'll see native crucifers with caterpillars on them like that as well. Sometimes you get some gems when you're hunting for butterflies. This is a, a, 
uh, giant Texas down into Central and South America. It's caterpillars feed on the citrus and the pom We don't have citrus growing in Chatfield, but this was found over at the, the Botanic Gardens Arboretum over there, the, whatever they call it, nature cornfield. Nature Center, corn maze, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I love, I love it over there. I really do. I've led butterfly walks there several times, and I really do enjoy there. I've been to a wedding there. I've been to the corn maze there, but it's not a natural area at all. It's a nice little nature area that's important. But this cool bug, and we saw this, this giant swallowtail here. So you get a good hurricane in the south, things can come a lot further north out of their range. Just because the book says its range is a certain distance, doesn't mean it won't migrate out of that range. Tropical butterflies are cool. This is one that uh, a long wing butterfly that can digest pollen. Most butterflies drink nectar, which is just carbos. That's all you get from nectar is carbs. So they don't, butterflies don't live very long. Usually 10 days or so is a lot for an adult butterfly, except for the ones that overwinter as adults. But for those that don't overwinter as adults, finding protein is the biggest challenge. You have to get it as a caterpillar, and they live off it for the rest of their lives. But the long wing butterflies from Central and South America, they can digest pollen. So if you go to the butterfly pavilion, look at the long wings, you'll see these big blobs of pollen on their, on their proboscis. And that's, uh, they're able to get the proteins out of it. So they can live up to six months. One of the cool phenomena that we see around here is what's called mud puddling. The butterflies you'll see along the edge of the creek or along the edge of the lake. And it's mainly the males, sometimes large groups of them. Plus there's three different species from left hand canyon up in Boulder. In one cluster, the pale swallowtail, the western tiger swallowtail and uh, one of the black swallowtail groups there. And they're clustered together. Uh, the males are getting that mud and they're not drinking the water, they're getting the salts from the mud. And by using radioactive, uh, radioactive isotopes, they may be able to trace where those salts go. The male actually passes it to the female in the sperm package. The female uses it to create the eggshells. The salts are used for the eggs. And how the female knows which males have drank and which ones have not, uh, maybe got blood mustache on them or something. <laughs> females will preferentially mate with a male that has been to a mud puddle. And so that's why the males are clustered all over the blood. The blues, the little blue butterflies, the bluish ones are the males, the brownish ones are the females. You see the bluish ones all over, just a mud puddle on the path you see together. Mm -hmm. The whites and the sulfurs do the same, mainly the males. Here's a, a bunch of whites in the mud puddle. Mm -hmm. Cool. Not everything feeds on nectar. The red admiral feeds on dung. Someone's got to, I guess. <laughs> Some feed on sap. But nectar's a main source of food. In the core, in the jungle, you'll see some that feed on rotten fruit. Butterfly domain mm -hmm. has the owls and the morphos that feed on rotten fruit and fruit. And, and fermented fruits eat the best. They like that dust, so you can pour a little beer on the fruit, they'll eat more of it. And if it's really fermented, you can watch the owl butterflies, they'll be vertical when they start, and they'll be to the side. <laughs> Uh, and they try to fly off and get the DUI on the way to wherever they're going. Um, amazing, nothing cooler than a drunk butterfly in the jungle. Uh, the ones that are dung feeders, you can attract them with dirty diapers. If you ever go out, go take a baby with you and go out in the field. You'll be amazed at what comes to the salts in the baby's diaper. When we were in, in uh, Venezuela, we had an infant with us, and we hung the dirty diapers up on a line just to bring in the butterflies that came with Really cool stuff comes to dump. Here it's mainly red admirals. But if you have a dog in the backyard, you'll clean up all the poop. You send out for these guys. They love it. Okay, butterfly versus moth. In our culture, uh, it's different in different cultures. Some cultures uh, will, will have different differences. In our culture, we refer to a butterfly as something that's brightly colored and flies in the day, but not always. The moths tend to be dull colored and fly at night, but not always. The butterflies have a skinny antenna that ends in a knob, but not always. Moth antennae are, are, are feathery or straight and end in a point, but not always. Uh, butterflies tend to land with their wings above their back like that, but not always. And moths will land usually with their wings flat on their back like that, but not always. But there's enough exceptions to the rule that scientists group them all together as lepidopter and scaly wings. And this is a moth. This is a giant silk moth from, from around here called a uh, Polyphemus moth. And I haven't seen one in over 10 years. Cecropia moths live here too. I haven't seen one in over 10 years. Why have these giant silk moths disappeared? It's a neat group too, because the adults don't feed. They don't feed as adults. They 
live off the fat they store up as a cat dog. They live maybe five days to a week as adults. And during that time, they have to make and lay eggs. And probably the reason they're disappearing is a few reasons. One is light pollution. They have only five days to live, and they navigate with distant lights. So, so say you're a moth flying at night. You see the moon off in the distance. You keep it over your right shoulder, you'll go the same direction. And when it's time to go back, you just keep it over your left shoulder, and you'll be going the same direction. The reason they're flying through our porch lights is not because they're attracted by them, they're confused by them. And you'll see that they're spiraling. So you keep the distant light to your right. If that light's not so distant, you'll find yourself going around it and spiraling and getting closer and closer. And then they land. You probably think they landed on the moon or something. But, but they're nocturnal. So when they land at the spot of the porch light, what do they do? They think it's daytime. What do they do in the day? They sit. They fly at night. So they think it's daytime. So they're confused by it. So light pollution is a major cause for the disappearance of some of the moth species around here. Because they only have five days a week to make and lay eggs. They're spending all that time sitting in the porch light, they're not going to do it. Another factor is parasites. There's lots of parasites now. The flies that lay their eggs in it. You ever see alien, that movie alien? Yeah. Kind of like that, same life cycle. The parasite lays its eggs in the, the body of the caterpillar, and the maggots inside, the wasp maggots, will eat uh, the fly or the wasp, whichever it is, will eat the organs of the caterpillar, saving the vital organs for last. The caterpillar still lives up, lives, lives, comes a pupa. And instead of a butterfly coming out, up comes a fly or a group of wasps or something. And there's some variation to that parasitic life cycle. A lot of parasites that feed on these things. And then the third reason why they might be disappearing is, is fox squirrels. Fox squirrels aren't native to this area. They follow the riparian forest up along the Platte and Arkansas to get to here. But we didn't have fox squirrels 150 years ago. And uh, they love to chew on cocoons. It's like a little piece of cane for them. They tear open the soap and they get the out in the middle. So these guys I haven't seen in more than 10 years around here, but we used to find them all the time on the... Uh, yeah, really big cocoons, silky cocoons. The moth. the moth is big, yeah, really big. And uh, you find the cocoons on red twig dogwood or yellow twig dogwood, uh, plants like that, which is used a lot in landscaping, but we're just not seeing them. I saw them. Uh, last year, last summer. Yeah. In my, my cool. Wow, good. It's good that this is what the caterpillar looks like. That's a perfect one. Little spiny. We used to find them on lilac too sometimes. Yeah, I, I hope they make it come back. That'd be good. Here's one a lot of people hate tomato hornworm. Or tobacco hornworm. It's got that horn on the tail. I think the tomato hornworm is black tail, the tobacco hornworm is red tail. They have a very similar life cycle, very steady tomatoes and tobaccos, both of them do. And people hate them in their gardens, but in our garden we grow extra tomatoes, some for them, some for us. So we always have enough uh, tomato. And these are like tarantula Twinkies for me, I'll bring them in the field of tarantulas. But a lot of people don't like them in their garden, and yet they love the moths. Have you ever been up your garden at night and see these moths hovering like hummingbirds? The adult of a tomato hornworm is one of them. This is called the, the uh, spotted, uh, spotted uh, sphinx moth or spotted hawk moth. That's the adult of the tomato hornworm. The more common one is the white line sphinx moth. The hover at the flowers looks like a hummingbird. Uh, I can't take credit for this picture. This is David anyway took this one. But uh, long proboscis that they nectar with. So this kind of moth actually does drink nectar as adults. The giant silk moths don't, but these guys do. And they'll feed just like a, a hummingbird. It looks like a hummingbird, but it's in the evening. What is their caterpillar? Uh, similar thing, hornworm. Okay. Just like the tomato hornworm. These guys, their caterpillar has more stripes on it. Uh, and uh, it's smaller than the tomato hornworm. But they have that little horn on the other. Do they lay their eggs on the, the tomato? Or? No. These guys lay their eggs on a whole bunch of different kinds of plants. And that's why they're so common around here. Do they find me? Find me? I don't think so. I wish they would. But they don't. Yeah, the only thing that seems to go after the barring weed is the, the, the gold beetles. The, yeah. It's too bad. I wish they'd go after buying me. Um, but yeah, they're really cool to watch it at sunset and watch these guys nectaring. A lot of things you'll find in a garden. Enough of butterflies and moths. Time to get on to the cool bugs, the beetles, <laughs> the cool insects. The, a lot of beetles are pollinators. You'll find them in your butterfly garden too here. This one is a checkered beetle. Checkered beetles are common one around here. Uh, real fuzzy bodies, so that's a good sign that it's a pollinator. If it's got a fuzzy body, it's going to pick up pollen on it. A lot of times you find them out there mating, 
Happy Valentine's Day. This, uh, um, these are blister beetles. Blister beetles are common around here. They're called blister beetles because if you eat one, you'll get blisters on the inside of your mouth. If cattle eat them, they'll get blisters on the inside of your mouth. They've got oil on their body that's, that's toxic to most mammals. And so that, you notice how they're not camouflaged. The bright morning coloration, black and red, warning things, don't eat me. There's something different about me. You don't want to mess with me. And so they use that warning coloration to advertise the fact that they're dangerous. In this case, they're toxic. Eat one, you're going to get blisters on your mouth. It's not pleasant. Longhorn beetles. A lot of them are wood feeders as larvae. Uh, real long antennas on them. Several different kinds around here. One of the longhorn beetles is very common around here. If you look on milkweed, you'll see the spotted milkweed beetles. There's about a half dozen different kinds that you'll find here in Chatfield that are different by the, the shininess or the placement of the spots. There's about six species of these milkweed longhorn beetles around here. And the cool thing about longhorn beetles like this is they make a cool noise. If you pick one up and hold it next to your ear carefully, because they'll bite if they get to hold your ear. Hold it close, but hold it by the edge, you know, by the sides. And you'll notice its head bent up and down. It makes a noise like ear, ear, ear. It'd be like if you picked up a Twinkie, but well, we don't have those anymore. If you picked up a little Debbie and it started going, you probably wouldn't want to eat it. That's the same with two of the predators. A mouse picks up one of these, or a longhorn beetle, and it makes a noise, and they're going to drop it. Now, in this case, if they don't drop it, notice the red and black color. It feeds on milkweed, which is toxic. This guy is toxic, too. It's got those milkweed toxins in his body. So if the ink doesn't scare it away and someone bites into it anyway, they're going to get sick from it. So double protection. Of course, it doesn't help the one that got bit. It helps his, his brethren that don't get bit when the bird remembers not to mess with them. So he hopes the ink scares them away instead. We do have fireflies here, but most of them don't light up. <laughs> this is a Colorado native firefly that doesn't light up, but it's in the same family. We do have fireflies that do light up here, but they're in pockets. Boulder Country Club has a pocket. The Poudre River in Fort Collins is a pocket. Roxborough State Park is a pocket. Roxborough State Park is closed after sunset, <laughs> so you can't see them unless you go on a firefly walk, possibly June 28th. We're talking about it. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Hopefully we can get a firefly walk going down there. We've done it in the past. The problem is the longest day of the year is the best time to find it down there. June 21st is the peak. And it's not like Ohio where you can read by the light. If you see a dozen, you're lucky. Poudre River, if you see a dozen, you're lucky. The largest concentration of lighting fireflies in Colorado is the Valley View Hot Springs in the Sandwich Valley, which is a clothing optional hot spring. So you've got to kind of be looking like right. <laughs> it's a cool place up because uh, no, no, no. Uh, above it is the Orient Mine, and at the Orient Mine is 100,000 Mexican free-tailed bats that spend their days there. And at sunset, a cloud of bats comes out into the Southwest Valley to eat insects. And, and it, it's it, literally a cloud of bats coming out at sunset. It's phenomenal. And then on the way back to the car, you can see fireflies. Hopefully you don't see too much else. <laughs> But yeah, that's one of the great pockets of fireflies here. Ladybugs, everyone knows the ladybugs. Or ladybird beetles, because they're not bugs. They are beetles. And then they fly with the hard wings to the side, and fly with the soft wings underneath. A lot of times, people will say, oh, ladybugs are so nice, they're so cute. They're vicious predators. <laughs> they'll bite the head off an aphid without thinking twice about it. And they'll bite a person, tasting it. A kid's holding a ladybug and gets bit, and they think nature's mean and cruel, but it's not. It's just part of what it is. It was just tasting them to see if there's something to eat. Uh, but they do have good jaws, and they are efficient aphid feeders as the adult and also as a lark. They'll lay their eggs on any plant that has lots of aphids on it. Uh, chow down. And one thing people notice about the ladybugs is the clusters. If you go on top of a hill, they do what's called hill topping. And it's usually around June that it starts into July and August. And what they're doing is they're setting up for their overwintering site already. And it seems a little early to be overwintering in June or July, but um, it's too hot down here a lot of times for the midsummer. And a lot of things like the aphids are gone. They're here in the spring, but they start disappearing towards midsummer. So there's not as much food down here. There's a lot more food in the mountains. So they'll go up into the mountains. They'll cluster in these 
these clusters here. Nice thing about that is come springtime, when it's time to find a mate, just roll over, there she is. A, take your pick, they're all clustered together. It works kind of like a singles bar. They all go to the same place, and they go to the top of the hill. When you can't go any higher, you know you're there. You're flying a log or a rock, you can crawl under for the winter, and that's where they spend the winter. So go up into the foothills this, this, uh, this uh, summer, late in the summer. And look for these clusters. It's really cool. Now, you see the ladybugs for hire in the in the garden centers. You can buy ladybugs for your aphids. Don't. They're terrible bugs for hire. They are collected in these overwintering pockets. Now, the first thing they do after mating, when they've done overwintering, is they disperse. They come down the mountain into the valley, and that's where they lay their eggs, where they can find food aphids in the spring. So if you take them out of the refrigerator and put them in your yard, they're going to mate and they're going to disperse. And your neighbor will benefit from it, but you won't. If you need something to kill your aphids in your garden, get a praying mantis, because they can't fly when they first hatch out of the egg. They have to go through the incomplete metamorphosis to be able to fly. So they'll stick around longer. They're better bugs for hire. These guys are terrible bugs for hire. Plus, there's huge areas of California where they're wiping out large populations of these guys to put them in the packages to put them in garden centers. So I don't recommend them for garden centers, but it's fun to do ladybug releases and stuff like that. You buy them from the garden center and let them go, knowing that they're not going to stick around, but they'll still go lay their eggs somewhere. A lot of species that are commonly found now are not native to here also. We've introduced new species to the area, uh, which have, and they've done really well because we feed them well. Uh, one beetle that is in the news a lot right now is the, the bark beetle. Large piece of forest, a little tiny, tiny beetle. You could fit half a dozen of these on, on a dime. Yeah, or on a maybe. Yeah, they're small. These are not big beetles. And a healthy tree can take care of it. They'll lay their egg on the tree, and the larva will burrow into it, and a healthy pine tree is going to produce sap, and that sap is going to kill the larva. But during a drought period, like we had a lot of drought here, um, during these drought periods, the, the tree can't defend itself. And if you get a large infestation of these beetles, the tree's going to die. It's not going to be able to produce enough sap to kill them uh, and block off their and, and so they've able, been able to get these huge populations going because of uh, the, because of the drought. And if you count up in the wood, you'll, you'll see the, the trails that the larvae make, chewing through the wood and stuff when they're killing the tree. Now, a lot of people say it's global warming that's causing all this, this destruction of the pine trees. But have you heard of the town of Deadwood, South Dakota? Got its name Deadwood, because when the explorers came over the hill, they came across a valley where all the trees were dead, or a lot of trees were dead. They were dead from the bark beetle. So this isn't something new. We've had drought periods in the past. We'll have drought periods in the future. We can't blame this on human activity necessarily. Uh, uh, one problem is that our forests are a lot thicker than they used to be, thanks to smoking the bear. Good intentions, bad science. It used to be we'd allow fires. They'd burn the plants off every now and then, so our forests wouldn't get nearly as thick as they are now. Uh, because of the density of the forest, the beetles are able to get to the next tree over very quickly. And so that the denser forest has a lot more to do with the, the problems than the warming periods. But as Deadwood, South Dakota will tell you, we have had beetles before. And we'll have them again. So right. does uh, the cold kill off the lot? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cold can kill off. If it gets bitter, bitter cold enough, it will. Uh, but we haven't had the really strong bitter colds lately. But we will. And we get them every now and few years. Yeah. Knocks them down. Okay, another group of insects that are called the hymenoptera or membranous wing includes the ants, the bees, and the wasps. Very successful group. Many of their species are social, just like us. They divide up labor into different tasks. So you'll have workers, you'll have the, the queen that does the egg laying, you'll have the males that all they do is mate, you'll have the ones that work in the nursery, the ones that go foraging, ants are among those. If you dig up an ant nest, you'll see the larvae, they go through the complete metamorphosis, the larvae are incapable of helping themselves, so they have to be fed by the worker ants that move the pupae around. If you disturb an ant nest, you'll see them moving all the different stages around. And ants are really a lot like us in so many ways. They are ranchers. You'll find them on a plant with aphids. They'll be moving those aphids around on the plant just like cattle. Why? Because they're milking those aphids. The aphids are very inefficient feeders, and their poop is sweet and sugary. 
This one. So um, they don't call it food. The honeydew. It's not polite. You ever hear of manna? The manna from the Bible when they're wandering around the desert and they're eating birds and finding the deserts in the Middle East. Inefficient feeders. They suck on the plant and the sugary stuff comes out. And the, the followers of Moses learned to eat it in the desert, good source of sugar. The ants have learned to eat it everywhere. And so they will defend those aphids from ladybugs and from other predators. And in exchange, they'll get that sweet honeydew that they feed on. So they're ranchers. They're scavengers. They have a cleanup crew. This beetle wasn't quite dead yet either, <laughs> but they'll, they'll finish them off. But dead insects and stuff. It work for things like ants that be dead stuff everywhere. And it's fun to take advantage of that, that desire to clean up their food. If you put a french fry out at different distances from the ant pile, you see how long it takes them to carry off the french fry. It's kind of fun to watch. The further out you go, of course, the longer it takes them to find it, the french fry and carry it back. But it's neat to watch them build a path to the french fry. And it's a pheromone trail. It's, it's perfumes. It's, it's a chemical trail that they leave behind and let's know where to go. It's very advanced, very cool. And we think of the queen as being in charge. She's not. She's an egg-laying machine. The colony works as a superorganism. The whole colony works together to get the job done. The queen doesn't shout out orders and commands. She lays eggs. That's all she does. And she only has to mate once and stores up the sperm for a long time. The most common bee you're going to find here is the European honeybee introduced to this area. Some people wanted to make this our state insect which I protested greatly. I know I'm of European descent and all, but we want it to be something native, and that's fortunately the fourth grade is picked up called our hair street, but there was a large group that wanted some European honeybee because it's so important for agriculture. A lot of food we eat is pollinated by European honeybees. It could be pollinated by native bees, but it's more efficient to use European honeybees. Now that the bees are getting diseases, they're getting mites and stuff that are hurting them, these are like cows in the insect world. We domesticated them. And so we have to take care of them. We have to give them uh, mite treatments. We have to take care of the diseases. We have to take care of the colonies in the way we manage their colonies for them. So by using these guys as our pollinating service, we're limiting our abilities to use the native bees. And more and more people are learning about native bees and how to use them for pollination. And that's going to help things out. You hear about colony collapse disorder, and that it's pesticides causing it. No, it's probably not. Colony collapse disorder probably isn't the real thing. It's, uh, it's something the press has kind of created in a lot of ways, unfortunately. The internet's fueled the fire. A lot of it's bad management. A lot of times people want clover honey. So these bees that used to feed on a variety of different plants, a variety of different diets, are only feeding on clover now. That'd be like if all you ate was corn puffs, uh, or all you ate was pretzels. And if you got to have variety in your diet, they do too. So by having them feed just on single plants, that's causing collapse. By mismanagement of the hives or not treating the mites properly, that causes collapse. These are cows. They need us to manage them properly for them to survive. And more and more you're getting amateur beekeepers, which is great. I really encourage people to do that. But you've got to learn how to take care of them if you're going to keep your own beehive. And a lot of people have it, and then they blame colony collapse disorder for their bees dying. Probably not. Um, so anyway, you'll hear a lot about it. Be skeptical of stuff you read about in the paper. But a lot of times, especially when it comes to insects, it's not necessarily true. A lot of it's hyped up. But they're pretty to watch them fly, and they go to flowers and stuff. Very efficient pollinators. They are um, imports. We, we domesticate them, but sometimes they'll break away from domestication, and the swarm will find a hollow tree or something to set up a feral hive. And, and they'll survive that way in these hollow trees. That's where they would have been naturally in Europe in their ancestry so they can adapt back to that situation. Some of our native bees, though, are just as spectacular. The bumblebees, fantastic colonies of bumblebees around here. All sorts of different colors. There's lots of good resources on the internet to help you identify them. Probably a dozen different species that we find right here in Chatfield. Different patterns of the yellow and black and orange on them. That's how we call them apart. Most of what you see are the workers in the summer. In the spring, you'll actually see the queen foraging around. She'll have to gather enough pollen and nectar to feed the first set of larvae. And then once those first set of larvae become adults, they become the workers, and they'll do the work, and she can just focus on egg laying. Uh, and then in the winter, or in the fall, rather, they'll produce new queens. Uh, those queens will go out and find places to spend the winter sheltered, like in a cave or under a rock or something, or a hollow tree. And then all the workers will die off. And so the way they perpetuate their, their gene pool is by producing those queens 
new queens in the fall and hoping that some of them survive the winter. So they start their colonies over every year. Whereas the honeybee keeps their colony going for as long as the queen lives. Bumblebees and a lot of yellow jacket wasps and stuff have to start over. Some of the other native bees, like the solitary bees, they don't mimetize. Every female for themselves. Every female will pick a burrow, get some pollen and nectar, make this little bee bread stuff with it, dump it at the bottom of the burrow, lay a single egg on it, and the maggot will eat the bee bread, and then in the spring, a new solitary bee will come out. This guy kind of doesn't sting. My mentor, uh, Earl Lamb, used to study these, and there's a closely related one that does sting, so he'd grab it. And if it stung him, he'd let it go. <laughs> it didn't sting him, it was a keeper, and he'd keep it for his bed. So uh, I didn't ever learn to do I learned to recognize them on the flower, and I wouldn't take them unless it was the right kind. This is something we talked about earlier. The hoverflies, the bee flies. This looks like a bee, but it's not. This is a fly. And, it'll, and the way you can tell, it only has two wings. A fly has four wings. It has these little balancing organs where the, the wing used to be called halteers. And why would they want to look like a bee? Well, because any bird that's ever had an a encounter with a bee got stuck in the mouth before or something is going to learn that anything that looks like this is to be avoided. So why take a chance on trying to figure out whether it's a bee or a fly? Just leave it alone altogether. So by mimicking the bee, these flies get protection. This particular one is water is known as an aphid lion. They'll lay their eggs. Uh, wait, is this one? No, forget it. That's wrong. I'm sorry. Erase that. That's wrong. That's What's wrong. that second? The other wings that called? Paltiers? Paltiers. They're just for balancing. Yeah. Or for flight. Uh, they detect wind speed. They're sensory organs. Uh, is a bee fly. It's kind of like a bee. It'll hover like a bee. This isn't as fuzzy as the picture you had, but this is one that we found on rabbit brush out. Uh, dinosaur National Land. We have these here too. Yeah, they, they make a buzzy noise. They mimic a bee as much as they can to keep the birds from eating them. One of the most famous flies is a mosquito. It's a fly. It has two wings. Has all tears. Uh, this one is uh, 80s trivitatus, common around here. Trivitatus tri vitae, three lines, two white lines, one brown line. So I can spot that one easy. It's uh, a floodwater mosquito. So they lay their eggs in the mud and then. The eggs won't hatch until the water rises. So they're real, they're real common. And during wet years, in the spring, we'll get a huge hatch of them. And those eggs can sit for years sometimes without hatching, freezing, thawing, drying out, until the water level rises and it's warm enough that they don't hatch. Um, so that's not the one that carries what's now. The one that carries what's now is the one I showed before that lays its eggs on the water. What's now virus wasn't here until 2002. Uh, really too cold in 2003. Thanks to West Nile virus, I have a summer job. You'll hear a lot about West Nile virus because it's the main uh, disease here in Colorado. It's mainly a bird disease. It goes between the birds and the mosquitoes. If an infected mosquito bites a horse or a human, that's called a dead end host. A mosquito can't bite an infected human and pick up the disease because there's not enough virus in our bodies. But they, a bird can build up enough virus that it can infect a mosquito. So it goes back and forth. It's mainly a bird disease. We hear a lot about it, but if you had been here 150 years ago, you might have learned about malaria here in Colorado. We did have malaria in Colorado 150 years ago. We eradicated it thanks to DDT. Now that we no longer use DDT, it'll make a comeback. It's already endemic in San Diego County. The species of mosquito that carries malaria still occurs in Colorado. We didn't wipe out the mosquito. We knocked their population down enough that there wasn't enough to carry the disease. So you might see malaria make a comeback sometime in our lifetime. Uh, that's the way it is. Uh, they used to be more common because that mosquito occurs around here. Some of the mosquitoes are absolutely gorgeous. This is one from Central America, metallic purple. It has these big leaf-like things on its legs. The most beautiful insect I've ever seen was not a butterfly. It was a mosquito in El Salvador. It was metallic green and purple and silver and gold, prettier than any butterfly I've ever seen. But that one carried dengue fever, so you couldn't let it bite you very long. But, uh, so a lot of people think mosquitoes are ugly. They have some are gorgeous, even our native ones. If you look at them under a microscope, gorgeous patterns on them. And people don't look at things close enough. A lot of times our attitudes are, are strange. We love butterflies, um, and yet they don't do a lot in the way of services for pollination or anything. They're just pleasant to look at. Uh, we love ladybugs, even though they're vicious predators. But we hate mosquitoes just because they carry diseases and bite us. They're actually quite gorgeous. Anyway. Um, just to, to kind of end things before we get questions. A lot of times when you're teaching about insects out there, this is what you gotta overcome. 
most people, their, their main source of information about insects is what they read on the internet or in the tabloids, and there's a lot of false information in there. There's a lot of stuff on the internet that just isn't true. A lot of stuff out there. This is what you're competing against. This is a mosquito picture. But uh, this is people's vision of, of insects is all hurting us, all harming us. A small, small percentage, less than 1% of the insects do us any harm. Most of them go on about our lives not even knowing that we're here. And we don't even know that they're around either. So very few actually compete with us for food or can do us any harm. Uh, and yet they have a bad reputation. But hopefully tonight you, you have a, a little better opinion of some of them. Uh, I just want to give credit Colorado State University, uh, some of the specimens, some of the pictures from them. Lots of people took pictures and donated them to me for my talks. And these are just some of them. Um, so I thank them for letting me use their pictures. I'd be happy to answer question you can have any. Yeah. Question about the galls on rabbit brush. Galls on rabbit brush. Cool. That's for what? I don't know. It's either yeah. a fly or a wasp. I'm not familiar. Boris would have known, right? The Boris there? Yeah. yeah. Boris knows galls. I don't know galls. All galls are either a fly maggot or a wasp maggot. And that tumor is created by the plant to encapsulate the gall so it won't hurt the plant. And some, some of them get really big. Some galls are huge species. And some are just little pinhead type things. And so even cancer researchers have studied those tumors that the plant creates because it's in response to whatever that maggot is putting off. It doesn't want the maggot to eat the, the whole plant, so it encapsulates it. It even provides it with more food so it'll stay in that one localized area. So the heat adaptation on the part of the plants. And so the plant and the insect are going all together. But uh, a lot of the galls you see are tiny, a type of tiny little wasp. There are some that are little tiny little flies. Uh, there might even be some uh, moth larvae that do that too. A lot of the leaf miners that you see, those are moths. You know, where you see a, a mining through the leaf, a little corridor between the two layers of the, of the, the membrane of the leaf. They'll eat all the big green stuff in the middle. That's a kind of uh, moth in most cases. There's also a fly that does that too. Yeah, but I don't know which one is the rabbit brush. You can probably Google it. Rabbit brush call it and say whether it's a wasp or a fly. But again, see immature stage, the adult stage flies around. Yeah. Uh, I think it's called European paper wasp. Yeah, European paper wasp. Um, I see them in my yard. Yeah, they're everywhere. Um, and um, they make their eggs beneficial larvae. And trying to see if At times, though, they kill a lot more butterflies than anything else. But people say the butterflies is not as many as when I was a kid. Part of it is because uh, bluegrass, rotomoa, you know, the, the habitat's destroyed putting in parking lots and bluegrass lawns where we should be putting in nectar for the butterflies. So that's partly why they disappeared. But the European pink wasp uh, will feed on the larvae. They'll carry them off to the nest and lay an egg on them. So what do you do if you want to kill them? I mean, they don't spray them. And then you can probably spray them. Yeah, spray it, right. Water knocks their nest into pieces, too. I prefer water. I don't like using pesticides. Because the rain kills everything else, too. So just cold water. <coughs> Wait till nighttime. Don't be close.